Good evening and welcome back to another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio and powered by our first sponsor, TireGit.com. That's TireGit.com. You all have to buy tires from somebody. You might as well buy them from us, help fund the movement, help support the movement. We all believe in the freedom of movement, and that's exactly what the establishment wants to take from you now. I am your host, Royce White, here in the belly of the beast, Minneapolis, Minnesota, for episode number 96, I believe. Today we have another incredible family and friends guest episode. Returning to the studio is the great Jonathan Mason. We promised him on Monday, no, Tuesday, and then it was Wednesday. Monday was Labor Day, right? But we got it done. I did an extra episode, I think, yesterday. I ran the creature from Jekyll Island yesterday. And today we got Jonathan Mason back in the studio. Happy to have you back in the studio. Thanks for joining us again. Appreciate um, it. Today, I just want to get to Jonathan Mason, the Jonathan Mason story. I'll let you start. Whatever, whatever you're thinking. All right. Well, First off, mm-hmm. where you grew up. You okay. know, we usually, when we do family and friends guest episode, we let people introduce themselves, tell us their backstory. You know, we skipped that part because you and I are boys. We went straight into the smoke. Um, but we got time. Go ahead and tell us your backstory a little bit, where you come from, um, how you were brought up, and things like that. What, what you know, the unique uh, details of your, your upbringing and Stop wherever you feel like. Okay, perfect. Well, born and raised in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Born at North Memorial Hospital right over in Robbinsdale. Um, originally went to 33rd in Emerson as a baby with my great-grandma, my dad, and my mom. Um, so started over North Minneapolis. Um, moved out to Plymouth for a little bit as a young boy. Went to elementary school or uh, kindergarten in Plymouth, um, and then moved to Crystal, um, and that's where a majority of my childhood, that in North Minneapolis, but really just a suburb right outside of Minneapolis, Crystal, um, went to, you know, all the schools within the district, Sandberg Middle School, um, Hostrom, well, Hostrom Middle School, Sandberg, then went to Cooper, tra- transferred from Cooper to Armstrong, graduated from Armstrong, um, but really was born Minneapolis, you know, a young boy went to school here, played sports here, basketball, football, wrestling, soccer, golf. Um, so just born and raised was really focused in on, you know, as a young boy, you know, just learning what it is to be a young man in Minnesota, but, Mm -hmm. um, mother and father, mom is from, you know, Maple Grove, Minnesota, Anoka area. Dad, is um from Memphis, Tennessee, um, but you know had his stint there, and we'll we'll talk about you know the family dynamic. But I'm just gonna give you, um, overview of kind of where they're from and stuff like that. He's from Memphis, Tennessee. Moved to Chicago as a young man, um, and then found his way up to Minnesota and met my mom. Um, a lot of people from Chicago in Memphis. A lot of people from Memphis that end up in Chicago. Got a little. Two way street there. I was we were just in Memphis. A lot of people from Chicago end up in Memphis, and it goes vice both versa. Ways, yeah, both, ways, both yeah. ways. And and that was a crazy dynamic with us being there too, because yeah. I got yeah, to family. I got to see my family that you know I wasn't really a part of growing up, just with my dad and him dying when I was younger. So, um, growing up really had a real close. And I'll get it. I'll get into more detail right now. Is um, I have four half sisters. Um, one died, unfortunately, but, and I, have oh, um, oh. brain aneurysm. Um, oh. and that happened kind of during COVID could have potentially, and they're thinking potentially from the shot, potentially whatever that could have been, mm-hmm. um, but Blood they, clot, something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that was a high suspect of what could have happened with her. But, you know, in Chicago, it just, a, hey, she died. We had the funeral later to rest and yeah. kind of, and it was during a crazy time during COVID. So it was like, you know, everybody couldn't be in there and um and and see what happened with her, but and so we had to later arrest. But then I also have a blood brother, me and him are, you know, Jefferson Mason. Yeah. He's a you know, well known great, the great Jefferson Mason. He and I were uh were we we weren't really high school basketball rivals because he's a little bit older than I was, but we definitely had some uh some legendary epic open gym uh matchups. I oh, think yeah. me and Jefferson probably almost got in a fight one time at an open gym. I rolled out there to Cooper because all my all my boys I grew up with on the north side. Right. 
ended up out there. At Cooper. Yeah, Cooper. Everybody randomly. From the North, yeah. they, none of them are from Robbinsdale. Right. None of them are from that area. Right. Maybe somebody moved to that. I, I think Rodney actually. Oh, that's how they ended Rodney up out Williams. There. Everybody. Big Rodney always lived in Robbinsdale. Yeah. He lived in Crystal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what it was. And if, for any of those who are familiar with Minnesota high school basketball, Rodney Williams was, um, you know, was was uh, one of my uh, one of my peers that that I came out with in 09 but he was really one of the one of the most athletic basketball players that I've ever seen. I mean, jumping ability, windmill from the free throw line, you know, went, went to, to 360. Went to the University of Minnesota, he and I and Trevor Mabakwe uh and and uh who would have been Al Nolan and and Blake Hoffarber should have played together at the University of Minnesota. I got myself in a little bit of trouble. Me and the U of M didn't see eye to eye. Trevor was going through some stuff as well at the same time yeah. from a previous situation. All in all, it didn't work out, and it really hurt uh, the University of Minnesota athletics. Although I think looking back on it now, everybody would agree they should have just let us play. Right. You our, guys had a squad. Our next schools let us play, and and we were very successful. In fact, not many people from that University of Minnesota team stay. But but anyway, you know, me and Rodney grew up together since the third grade. And um, a few of our players, I think about five or six of our players from that original Minneapolis Hustler team that was based on the north side ended up at Cooper. Right. So now I'm shooting over to Cooper, bringing some of the Hopkins boys yeah. or bringing some of the De La Salle boys to come run open. And gym really, over my there. brother, he built, was already there. And he, well, he built really built the Cooper program. Yeah, Cooper up. was all, Cooper was already yeah. good before Rodney got there. Yeah, yeah. But Jefferson was, and Jermaine and, and, and Big uh, Dennis, Dennis, and you know they had a squad already. But anyway, yeah, me and Jeff. I remember the first time I, I met Jefferson. We were at an open gym, and uh, you know we just you know we're playing, talking, talking, talking shit back and forth. Yeah. And I kind of looked at him. You know, something happened. I kind of looked at him. I'm like, who, who the fuck is this dude? Right. And he like, who the fuck are you? Right. And I'm he like, oh, I like these dudes. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know these guys, but I like these he's, guys. He's my little bro. He's a good dude. But shout out to Jefferson Mason. Yeah. He's shout a out good to guy. little bro, man. Yeah. I love him. To love death. him to death. Yeah, he's uh, a good dude. Um. And so me and him very close. We're year apart. Grew up, you know, in Crystal, North Minneapolis area. He really took the route of, you know, playing sports and stuff like that. I played up to a degree, but I see my father died when I was young. So I was on point all the way up until Maurice died. When my dad died, he died, unfortunately, of cancer. Um, and I can tell you his story real quick. You know, he from the South, you know, family are descendants from slaves. So the mentality was slave mentality. Um, we found out when I was down there, my great grandfather built the biggest church in the South Brown Baptist church, Rayfield, um, Flynn senior. And so really didn't have that dynamic of that information then, but my father, very powerful man, you know, in, in, you know, went to Vietnam. So was in Memphis, the mother left him went to Chicago and just took the kids and left. He was about 15 years old in Memphis by himself, broke the picket line, got beat up real bad by the KKK and they almost Wait, killed him. So tell me, so he was 15 years old Yeah, in Memphis. In Memphis. And mom, and stayed with dad when mom left with the yeah. kids? So dad was a rolling stone. Okay. Now grandfather had 17 kids. Um, God bless his heart. Yeah, God bless his heart. Yeah. And, and, and this is how I came about. So God bless his heart. God bless his heart. Um, and then his father. So his, his father was a slave. Okay. So one of the last slaves in Memphis at 1882 was like, I'm about to build this church. You guys got to stop doing this. Fast forward, he had a kid. His son, Rolling Stone, was a bootlegger mm -hmm. in Memphis, Bill Street. Um, had 17 kids. Met my grandmother. Had a couple different families, but met my grandmother. Had four or five kids with her. Mm -hmm. She was like, I'm done with this. I'm going to Chicago. Just left him and his brothers out there. I um, mean, he had some resentment with her about that, but she went to Chicago um, in the six, early sixties and left them. And so during that time, the early late fifties, early sixties race down in Memphis, Tennessee was out of control. Yeah, big, big time. Um, and you know, they were known. It for was a hot spot hotspot yeah right and so and this is the dynamic that we can be able to speak on race so easily because our families and everybody the dynamic of what we're dealing with is actually embedded in the real american fabric of who we are right mm -hmm. and so father went to chicago grew up with larry hoover and them mm -hmm. got into the gds right early gangster disciples gangster disciples mm -hmm. um uh enforcer one of the you know honorary members enforcers um 
then he had to go to Vietnam. Chipped out, was like, all right, go to Vietnam. He got drafted. Got drafted. Mm-hmm. He went there, Marines, front line, right to Vietnam. Django got dropped off right there. For a lot of black men in Chicago and these areas, when the draft was called, they were like, this is a better opportunity for us. It, it's so bad here. We'll go somewhere else, and if we have to go kill other people, we'll do whatever we need to do to get up out of this situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think America played to a lot of those vulnerabilities within those you know, communities because of the dynamic of what Vietnam was. So dad went over there, um, you know, got him, got himself in some trouble. You know, the heroin was running around freely over yeah, there. Yeah. Um, and they were exchanging, um, heroin for tobacco. Okay. And so, you know, young black men it, it, at that time, a lot of them were sending heroin back and getting themselves in trouble. He was part of those, the group of guys that did got in trouble there came back home and really within, you know, being in a, you know, a gang and stuff like that, he got himself in a little trouble and he, you know, went to jail, had my four sisters, got out of jail, came to Minnesota, shot right up to Minnesota, came up to Minnesota, runs into a tall, we talked about other left, tall, blonde hair, Scandinavian Scandinavian woman, white woman, right? Changed his life. Yep, it changed his whole life, right? Um, <laughs> she didn't want nothing to do with him, right? Just was like, ah, leave me alone. They were at, there's a local bar that back in the day, most of our, all of our parents went to is uh, Bunkers, or not Bunkers, it, it's called uh, Moby Dicks. It was Moby Dicks. Every, you see the, all the classic Minnesota signs. You see Moby Dicks when one well of a drink. That's where my mom and dad met, right? Um, he was a bouncer. My mom was there, white woman going out downtown. He walked up to her and said, hey, look, you finna marry me. Um, and she never had no black man come up to her like that. And so that was a crazy dynamic. She said, this dude's crazy. He kept on saying, hey, look, you keep coming up. So, but I, I just want to point out, not yeah. to cut you off, but I want to point out, Pops yeah. comes from... Broken childhood in yeah. some respects. Yeah, broken childhood. Goes to Vietnam, war torn. Everybody knows Vietnam was hard on all the people who went to Vietnam. Front line. Just, just from the war itself, let alone the drug issues that came out of it. Yeah. Then being involved with the gang there in the, in the city of Chicago, which is even in the 60s was rough. Huge. And it was the revolutionary type yeah. I mean, foot it, soldier going. Well, I mean, let's let, there's a big, there's a stark difference between the gangs that emerged in Chicago right. in the 60s. Right. In seventies, and the gangs that exist in Chicago today, correct, there was completely an, different, an entirely different philosophical edifice, and they had legitimate reason at that time to really be um, uh, invested. The men had a reason to be invested in banding together, correct, in a counter initiative. I mean, counter counter establishment, counter government initiative, and I mean the the government records show that the documents show that the the blacked out declassified information from Hoover and and the FBI and all these people, they show that in all actuality, there was a real racial animus against black men Yeah, for, for a multitude of reasons, not just black men, but all, but a lot of people, the government was already out of control. Then black people formed together to do their thing then. But I'm pointed out because with all those things being said, still valued the, the idea of marriage. Right. Came and up it, to your mom and said, I'm going to marry you. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah then, uh-huh. and, and, and you brought up a major point about gangs in Chicago at that time. It was, you know, we had the Fred Hamptons who just got killed. Mm-hmm. We had the Rainbow Coalition. The we, original Rainbow Coalition. The original Rainbow Coalition. Between Coal- the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, yeah. who were Spanish, yeah. and the Young Patriots, yeah. who were white. Right. The Rainbow Coalition of... of, of, of we're going to take care of our working own Working class. Yeah. Black, whites, and Latinos that came together to say, hey, something ain't right. Yep. And that's when the government regime, there's two parts of America, America versus the government, right? Mm -hmm. And we always say this, black men have, and black and people of color had a already a weird sense about government already then. In in the 60s, it was crazy because the family dynamic, and my dad was from a broken home. But the black dynamic was 85, 90% of the families were married, right? In the, the black community. In the black community. Right. And they knew, and now obviously with declassifications of the operations that were against the Martin Luther Kings and the Fred Hamptons, Malcolm, everybody else, and Malcolm X's. Malcolm, Muhammad, we, Elijah Muhammad. Yeah. Everybody, a lot we, of them. Yeah. We had the, they had the structure to beat 
the globalist regime that we're dealing with today. You're talking about the gangs. The gangs did with the Rainbow Coalitions. Well, and you got to, and again, it's it's hard to, it's hard for people to, it, it, I think it's. Because they see gangs now. It's hard for people to understand the, the inception of gangs, I, I think, today, because the way it's promoted. And I think Kanye West made a great point that, you know, re regarding the Black Panthers. And look, the Black Panthers, if you, if you talk about any of these black leaders, and I said this before on Steve Bannon, I'm going to let you go back to finishing the way yeah. you grew up. But, no worry. but we'll work out, we'll work through it through the, out the, throughout the entire interview. But I think this is such an important point early on because as we go into one of the most important election cycles in American history and the black vote is going to become such a, a, prominent, um, a prominent issue uh, in, in this election cycle, a lot of white Americans don't really understand the dynamic of, of black America right. when they would like to. They, right. act, they they actually want that information. And it's valuable to them. They're, they're not shying away from it. They just don't go anywhere where they can actually get it. Bingo. A lot of the black a lot of the black people who've come into the Republican Party have not been from the streets. They right. were they were black people who grew up around white folks right. who were naturally Republican, usually Correct. in the rhino manifestation of silk-stocking Republicans. Yes. So they tend to want to lean towards being a silk-stocking Republican. Right. And they talk like that, right? And we and have so, the Kendall Qualls. And, and so, yeah, and then, you know, they they can't really speak to any authentic black Correct. message because they don't know it themselves. And, and the Democratic Party the has way, already took it, the it, other look, faction. It, and it's, it go, the, the pendulum swings both ways. It's the same way if you take a white kid from the suburb, a, a, a white, like my grandmother, who came from, was a first generation immigrant from Norway, uh, and, and she, she was from Duluth, but she ended up in the cities. And, you know, if you take somebody who's, uh, if you take a white person, you plop them down in the in the neighborhood. Yeah. And they grew up there their whole life. Yes. They can't really speak to what it's like to live in Duluth right. anymore. Correct. Right. So that that's just a that's just a matter of culture, being able to change the way that people view and see the world and can speak to the world. But I, I bring that up because it's very hard for white Americans, I think, today to grasp the idea that these early black movements were much of the energy that's needed today. It's much of the energy that the populist nationalist movement is starting to... And the conservative parties. The conservative movement is starting yeah. to latch on to now. Yeah. I mean, even if you can hear them saying the same things. And you're also starting to hear echoes throughout social media that some of the same anti-establishment, anti-government, anti-tyranny sentiments, right. although the race still ends up being a divide. And a lot of these same white folks just tend to think, ah, oh, well, black people were just complaining. But now you're starting to see like, ah, no, we were the early warning signal to a person like Lyndon B. Johnson and Edgar Correct. Hoover who were in charge of the intelligence community and the, 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 the police state. And it just took a while to circle around everybody else. Uh, and even on vaccines. Yeah. In, 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 the vaccine. In, 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 but, but again, I wanted to say, I said this on Bannon once, and I said it on Jason Whitlock once, the early black community leaders gravitated towards a socialist, communist, political worldview because to them, capitalism itself was the highest level of the political corruption that they right. saw. Right. To them, capitalism was the, was the head of the snake. Right. And obviously now we see that it's not, it's not capitalism, it's, it's Satanism, it's anti-God, it's anti-humanism, it's technocracy. So there, we, we, that part of it has evolved for us to be able to see like, ah, yeah, capitalism, I mean, that that sounded good. It was easy to latch, even for Malcolm, who I love to death. And, right. You know, Malcolm X is one of the most profound right. American political figures of all time, let alone, uh, you know, black political figures. But even he leaned towards the communist thing because to them, white America and capitalism was their their greatest enemy. Yeah, see, but and, and you, you touch on multiple points that you know I'm going to come back and talk on, oh, yeah. Um, for for me are in for you know okay you talked about a crazy dynamic of black america kind of being the smoke signals for before globalism yeah right yeah yeah and when they were saying socialism then they didn't know the grasp of what they're do, talking about now the socialism that they're talking about now is what the globalists are entering in and bringing and ushering in they had you don't have socialism 
when you're feeding your own local communities. They call that socialism, but they really do want black empowerment. So they said, we got a young Fred Hampton who's, he got murdered at 21 years old. So he was talking like that at 19 and 20 years old, mm -hmm. 18 years old. When they said, oh, you're a socialist, they're talking about, they're thinking about people like Chavez and they're talking about others, revolutionaries like um, the guy Jacob from- Vera. Yeah, all these people mm -hmm. who they said socialism and, and they ushered in a complete different thing, right? They're saying, oh, we're gonna take care of our own country. And this was at the same time they killed JFK and stuff. So we, 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 the socialism conversation. The isms, the isms got real funky. Yeah. All we, all we know for sure. And I said this the other day, the, the start of it, which Malcolm X and I think a lot of those black leaders couldn't really identify at the time. Although if you go back and you listen to them, they're saying it. And I think the communist socialist aspect really came from, um, uh, it it really it really was a rejection of the crony capitalism and racism that had that had spilled out in, right. in America at right, that time. Right, 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 right. And 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 so just like when the Civil War was fought, you see a bait and switch. You you see each side come pre baked with a piece that the other side shouldn't that needs. Right, right. With the with the Civil War it was. Yeah, slavery is bad, but now we're going to abnegate states' rights. Right. Okay. With 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 racism in the in the early '60s, it was America is at the height of American manufacturing and has self sustain has uh, independence, yeah. has uh, self sufficiency, but it's baked in with this racial segregation. And, and things. okay, and on so that got, piece, right? So so Malcolm and those guys like they seen it. We want to. They should have lat latched on to the fact that capitalism had led America to a moment of, of true independence and then demanded their own independence within that American citizenship. This is where Lyndon B. Johnson comes in. Okay, right, okay. right. Lyndon B. Johnson comes in because now the height of American manufacturing in the 60s, we said, what was the dynamic? We said 80 to 90% of the black families were married. Mm -hmm. Now there was the black component. They're having more kids than us that we've got to stop the black family. So this is where the talking points for the Republican Party could come in right here and say, okay, Nixon said was a part of it and said, we're going to take those black jobs in those inner cities and send them to China. Mm -hmm. So now we're dealing with China because Nixon tried to stop the black folks from building themselves up as a, it's a major fact. force it's in a America. In the, in the national and those were conservative black people. Absolute married, had a family. Were working class. Didn't were, believe in were, Marcus Sanger. Were, were, were hardworking. Worked Hard, with their hands. Craftsmen. Worked in the in the manufacturing plant. Worked, you know, as tradesmen, as electricians, as plumbers. As these were working class. So people. how do we disrupt it? Vietnam. That's where my dad. Vietnam. Did. So yeah, Vietnam. Well, well, but it's a whole. It's, it's a whole. It's a whole system. And then when you talk about systematic racism, there was a a a, a laundry list of systematic things put in place. Right. To disrupt right, the black right, right. The black family right. that, that they admitted to that they've admitted to. Yeah, it's not even yeah. It's 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 right out there in the open. And what I also wanted to say on on top of this was the black the the black people of of that era. Right, they gravitated towards Malcolm. Their whole political understanding was, um, I don't want to say it was. Infant, infantile. Yeah, I don't want to say it was. It was. Uh, you they know, were ignorant. It was young. They, yeah, they, remember, black folks were just getting out of. <laughs> they didn't have any education. Come on, I mean to so talk about. So uh, what I was saying, I'm sorry. What I was saying was, <laughs> I mean, we're not calling you dumb, right? But we were just getting voting rights. Remember, voting there's, rights. There's, right? there's basic politics. There's right. basic rights. Right. They, that's what they call basic rights. Civil rights. Basic fundamental right, right. Human rights. Right. But then there's politics at the world stage. Right. And so the black community is just now catching up with intellectual traditions that come out of post enlightenment Europe. Right, and understanding what they really are. I'm, I'm meeting. That's black where people. colonialism I'm came. I'm meeting in. black people every day. Yeah, they they all thought they were anti-colonialist, but then they adopted the real centerpiece of colonialism, which was anti-secularism. Yeah, right. S -s the the secularism was the intellectual idea that started the whole movement. Right. Then you had liberalism. Right. Then you had communism, and now you get globalism. 
and I, I said it before. With that, Marxism. Well, but but not even really. The Marxism is just like, a, the Marxism is communism. Yeah, that's, that's, what, it, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. But um, the, the globalism is the bastard child of liberalism and communism. Yeah. Secularism is the grandfather of them all. All right? of them. Right. And so people, when Malcolm was talking, you, it, this is how it's hard for people to parse how Malcolm could be a God, a, di a disciplined, God-fearing Muslim, right, and align himself with communists, right, because to him, communism wasn't explicitly anti-God, right, and they all had these ideas that they could morph communism and socialism and into something that incorporated their faith practice. You even hear Malcolm say in certain moments, he'd go, "A man's religion is is, is a man's religion. That, but politics is politics." Correct. Right. That was the famous speech where right. he's there with Martin, where he's there with all the other black leaders. And they're like, whether you're Christian or Muslim shouldn't matter. We're black nationalists. And anytime you, you know, they didn't realize that, that the, the real fight against the black family and black people was the anti-God secularism. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and so and I'm, and I'm going back to my father's story, too, yeah. with yeah. Vietnam was. Please. So as a young black man, he went to Vietnam, didn't have a clue, came here. Right. Try to find a job, try to do this, went to the club, found, had this very conservative. I'm telling you, and I'm going to get it into this, more conservative than I've ever seen anybody else. And remember, he's from Chicago. So we hear all these rhetoric talking points. Oh, they're from Chicago, well, he's from Memphis, but went to Chicago. Let me tell you, my dad, so he came to Minnesota, met my mom, Moby Dix. He says, I'm with you a couple of times. He robs her, robs her, okay? Takes a chain, he gets in trouble. He sends her chain back to her house and says, something made me give it back to you. You're actually going to be my wife. Okay. Now my mom said, this dude, black dude from Chicago is crazy. Okay. Fast forward, he gets out of jail for some other thing. He sees my mom again. They kick it. Here comes Jonathan coming. Jonathan comes. Oh, you going to keep my baby. We going to do all this. Okay. Now, remember my so dad. Mom, so mom was a little thrill seeker. So uh, thrill. He pulled it off. Okay. He pulled okay, it off. Okay. Maybe they had nowhere to go. Minister, Stay with mom. Mom dude's listen, had it. Minister in the belly of the beast. <gasps> Let me tell you. I, Save a man's soul. Go ahead. You know, so, mom, so wait. First, the first mom, thing that cracks off is dad's hanging with mom. They're kicking it. He steals her chain. Chain. But then says Kicks it. it but, you know, one night stand type. Kicks it. Takes a chain. Takes everything. Then still, you can send the chain back to her. Sent the chain back to her. Then goes to jail for something else. So he goes back. And when he gets out, out, baby, God told me to be with you. This is it. Yeah. She says, okay. They have a shorty, me. Okay. <laughs> My brother's a year younger, Jefferson. Yeah. As she's pregnant, he gets shot. He gets shot up over Dad. south. Dad, shot up. Beat bad. I'm talking about it's all in the news. He gets shot. They, well, let me tell you. He runs up in the trap house to go rob the trap house. They hit him with a nine millimeter right in the neck, Bam. right next to it. But he was big body. So, you know, he benched 450, big dude. They shot him. He kept fighting. Okay. He's fighting with him. They knocked all his teeth out, put him in a coma. He actually is walking over south. They drop his body over south. He gets up walking to HCMC. Woozy ambulance finds him. He passes out. He's in a coma for two weeks. Now he's at HCMC, coma. Mom Dukes is pregnant with my brother. Mom, my grandma comes up from Chicago. Oh, and they done seen death a thousand times. Oh, I don't want to see my baby like that. Pull the plug. Okay. Now brain dead. My mom's. Your dad's mom. My dad's mom who left him. Okay. Okay. Yeah. He already angry with her. Yeah. She comes to Minnesota. Not always, they already don't have a good relationship. No. No. Now she come but up he's saying, trying to be a good son, go back, check yeah. in on mama in Chicago on the west side. she comes up and says, pull the plug. Pull on. the plug on my back. I don't want to see my baby like that. I'm like, all right. Well, my mom says, well, we know your situation with him. Love my grandma to death. But if there's really a God, this is where God comes in. Mm. If there's really a God. Okay. Let me tell you my mom's. So that's my dad. We're, we're at the coma at the hospital. Hold that spot. Mother. Don't say if there's really a God. People might misinterpret. Oh, that. no, no. This he, The question my mom says. Is there really God? I'm going to bring it full circle. Mm -hmm. So mom from Maple Grove, white woman, was a jazz blue singer with my grandfather, Dee McClay, one of the biggest bands in the city, right? Um, she sings at all the bars, the strip clubs, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. here in Minnesota. My grandpa's getting, making, he makes it, you know, he's making deals, shake. My mom 
becomes a hairstylist, gets into the streets. When I tell you the streets, she was the escort for the mafia, okay, out in New York. So they have her out in New York, almost prostitution, but we know the women who play men for money type. She wasn't out on the corner. Only fans, escorts. Only fans, escorts. We know them. It's only fans before only fans. Yeah, my, my, Mom Dukes was getting them. Yellow pages. Tr yeah. Back page. Back book. Okay. Tricks. Got it. Tricks. Okay. Okay. You had probably a pimp. Okay. She was out there in New York. She comes back. Okay. So mom goes out there. Grandma says, no, babe, you got to come back. Comes back, starts her own business, gets into the salon, work, meets my dad. Okay. Now, there, she's about 28. My dad gets her pregnant. She has my brother get shot. Now they're at the. Now we're at the. Or now we're at the hospital. Mm -hmm. She said, "Is there a God? I'm going to keep Maurice, keep him alive. I'll pull the plug in a week if you don't pull out." Wednesday comes, pops wakes up, out the hospital. Wow, brain intact, life changed. Walking himself. Walk gone. We're not paying for nothing. Come on, we leave. <laughs> was in a coma. In they a coma. He was brain dead. Pull the plug. He brain act pops right back on on Wednesday. He walks out. Whoa. Okay. Life dramatically changed. Goes from GD to God's disciple. There you go. Overnight. Yeah. Okay. Now, that'll now do, we got Maurice. Now my dad changes his life. Gets a job. Gets a get uh over at Park Center High School. He becomes a head engineer over there. We're living a good life now. Okay, mom, do they, you know they go through their stuff? We ain't have the most money. Mom's is hustling. He's hustling. We're good. I'm out in Plymouth at kindergarten. We I go over to um um San, uh, Middle Lake Elementary. Life is good. Okay, life is good. Now let me tell you, Maurice changed though. He didn't see the light. He's already in the hood, West Side of Chicago. South side, everybody knows my dad. Top biggest pimp in Chicago and gangster at the time because Larry Hoover's gone. My dad running stuff in the 70s, 80s. Now, pimping. We got to remember pimping. He was pimping and all that. Well, he changes his whole life, and he still is rough Maurice, but for God. Now, people, now people know who I am as far as I'm out in the community. I'm very vocal. I stand up. We led biggest marches in history, all that. Now, this is our backdrop, but this is my, my dad would pull up. We had our church. Our church pulled up. Two speakers, just like you and me did. <laughs> Loring Park Pride. With Mom Dukes, Scandinavian soldier, who, remember, told me, is he wearing a dress? Type energy. My dad, when I was five, six years old, would be at Pride with a hundred gay people around him talking about kill him, diseases, all, all type of crazy stuff. And my dad would take that dress off. God, he pulling up the Bible and he'd be arrested. So I was seeing my dad get arrested for speaking out against all the things in the Bible because he was a brand new Christian, life saved. He's out here soldier. Oh, we're going to die on this. We, we about, No, went from GD shooting and Vietnam soldier to now North Minneapolis, Loring Park, where we had mm. our game. Chant going to the north side, mm, snatching, yes. snatching crack out of crack dealers. Hey, no, you ain't finna smoke crack around here. Amen. This, this is what he was doing over north, Minneapolis. Now, we're doing this every weekend. <laughs> this is what we're doing. <laughs> I'm going to school. I'm getting in trouble for saying Jesus loves everybody because I didn't know the liberal agenda within the school district. So I'm thinking I'm being good. Jesus loves us. Don't steal. Don't do this. I'm getting kicked out of class all the time as a fourth and fifth grader. No. So I, yeah. So I already So knew. wait a minute. Even then. Because I was so radical into Christianity with my mom and dad. My But even then the school was. was then. But I didn't have the mindset. Persona non grata. Yeah. So I would say. Gee, now. Now I look, that I look back and I think about public school myself. I went to. I came up in the public schools in St. Paul. I came you up. You went to Catholic school though, right? Or no? I went to Catholic school on and off. I went but it to was Catholic more conservative. School. I went to Catholic school for first and said, well, you got to realize, I mean, even when you go to Catholic school, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of Chinos, a lot of Christians in name only too. Yeah. Especially in the Catholic community. Right. A lot of Chinos. Oh, man. And, they, you know, some weird, weird Catholics. Don't get me wrong. You know, I love the Catholic. Love the, I'm Catholic to un, unashamed. Right. Black people say all the time, are you following a white man's religion? First mm -hmm. off, Christianity is not a white man's religion. Right. Christianity was in Africa 
before it was in Europe. Right. Okay. So you guys, Ethiopia, Philosophy Jews. You guys, his history is a little off. Not even Ethiopia, but there was Christians in Africa because it's it's yeah. quicker to trap when when the when the when the <laughs> exodus. Okay, that's another story. We're not gonna get out okay, of that. But I'm just two, saying, well, you know, we will. I'm Catholic. I'm right. A, I'm Catholic, but okay. you know, unashamed. But the Catholic community has some, you know, has problems. Right. And I'm not even getting into pedophilia. I'm just talking about some. Some some hypocrites, right. some blasphemers, right. some, and you find in, in going back to the people. story because we'll go off on th- years. But on no, that. what I'm saying yeah, is 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 um, I grew up in the Catholic school sometimes, but then sometimes I was in public school because mom would move around. Single mom, right. she's living in apartments, maybe better deal over here, leases up. She has to move over right. here, whatever's right. available. Doing what you had to do wherever I lived, what's closest to get me there in an efficient way. So I end up at public school too. Uh, and yeah, I remember now thinking about it. The public school was extremely adverse to any type of faithful discussion, any type of Christianity or anything. Right. And 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 now looking at it where we're at, and we talked about this briefly, and we don't gotta jump on this tangent, but we said, where are the radical leftists? And you and you hit it right on the nose, you said in our university and our schools, and that's yeah. where they're at. And so in I the was grade schools. Yeah, in the grade schools. And I go now, to Hopkins, I go to Hopkins uh elementary, Allison Smith. Yeah. I go to Allison Smith. Let me tell you this story once before we, yeah, before go, we go. Yeah. I go to Allison Smith. No, I go to the middle school because the uh, the young boys practice up at the middle school. Now my son's in the middle school. He goes to seven, he's in seventh, eighth grade. Right. So he's in the middle school. But before a lot of the teams practice in the middle school, I go up to the middle school for a, a, a game one day. This is a tournament. This had nothing to do recent? with recent. This was two summers ago. Okay. But you know, Fairly I'm in recent. I'm in the Hopkins area. Right. I mean, I've been I'm, You're I'm always, here. Yeah. But but um I go up to the school for a tournament and little Royce is about to go into his game and he and he says, uh, I gotta go to the bathroom. And you know me, I'm thinking I'm thinking, come on, dude, why you didn't think about going to the bathroom before, right, before you got to the game? Yeah. You know how Pops thinks. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And, but so I'm like, I'm like, all right, go ahead, run, hurry up. Hurry up and go to the bathroom. So he's going to the bathroom, and I don't, I don't see him for, like, it's taking a long time. So I'm like, this dude had to go to the, like, really go to the bathroom? Like, you know. Let it, me go check on let him. Let me go see what's going on. So I go to the hallway and pop my head down there to see what he's, and he's standing outside. And I'm looking, I'm like, why is he standing outside the bathroom and he knows we got a game, like he's got a game he's got to right. play. And he's kind of, he has this weird look on his face, like he's looking at the wall. And I'm like, dude, if, if you don't, what are you doing? You know, right. in my mind, I'm going, what are you doing? Right. You know, kind of standing with this deer in the headlights look. So I walk down there and and by the time I start to approach him in the hallway, he can see I'm very irritated with the situation. I'm right. He, he, he's, Pops is upset. He's got an explanation ready. He starts to give an explanation as I'm walking up. He puts his hand up and gestures towards the, the bathroom. And I'm like, what, dude? What's, what's, what's up? I go to look at the bathroom, and it's got 40 signs mosaic together with transgender signs. He don't know which bathroom. Transgender symbols. And he's sitting there. And then as I get up to him, I walk up, get close enough to him, I notice that a bunch of other boys are, are standing there trying to figure the shit out. They don't even know what. They don't know which bathroom to go in. I'm trying to, no, this is serious. This is the agenda. This is what's really going on in these public schools. People don't realize. I'm dead and serious. And if you're not telling your kids this, you're putting them in, the, in, in we talked about this earlier, yeah. It, it, yeah. Re- referencing Alex Jones quickly. Yeah. The great. Alex Jones. The great Alex Jones. <laughs> if you allow people to dress up in costumes and parade as monsters around your children for eight hours a day without you saying anything to them, you're in on it. And you're not going to stop nothing that these people have. If you're not indoctrinating your kid with truth, you know, it's it, we laugh around and say, you know, we've seen Juana Man. Oh, no way in heck. And now you see Leah and you see all these people coming out and you're saying, hold on. Now I got to say that a man can have a baby. And if I don't, I'm harmful or angry. And speech then, crimes. Speech crimes. And we're going to talk about that. Mm-hmm. But, the, and, but and, we'll, and we'll come back to that. But I'm, I'm, so, yes, I'm in school. I'm getting in trouble. Let's mm-hmm. bring it back. Yeah. You know, you know the liberal thing was I know like it was out there. All you know is Christ because dad's newfound saved. 
GD. Christian. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but God disciple. God, God disciple, okay, right? Good. So now he's changed. He we're going to the west side of Chicago, pulling up on Douglas Drive, preaching to the crackheads, preaching to the drug dealers, to the prostitutes, the pimps, the gang members. My dad's taking guns from people. Um, what is going on, right? As a young boy. Going to jail, standing on it regularly. So this is what I was raised up. So people say, "Why? Well, you mar you shut down highways." And I was raised that way, right? Um, okay, I was born this way. Um, and so, so fast forward, wonderful life. We're parading around the city. Dad pulls me aside. I'm 12 years old. Looks at me and say, "Hey, look, I'm finna die in six months." I'm like, "Oh, won't be here no more." You're going to take control. It, this, I'm 12 years old. My brother's 11 years old. We still got snotty noses. We're still arguing over playing up to a thousand as kids. Now he just breaks this news to me as a G. I'm going to be gone six months. Take care of your mom and them. I'm saying that I don't know if I should cry. I don't know what to do. Everything will be straight. So, okay. So I'm living like this. Now we're trying to figure it out. He, he's slowly deteriorating. Right. And this is, he has a crazy cancer. They don't know what it is. Right. Now, many people that went to Vietnam, the same time he went, had Asian orange and all these. And so people the same age time as him, they're all dying of crazy stuff. Right. All the doctors can do is say, give you radiation, chemo. So I'm seeing him, the strong, benching 450, huge, strong black man talking how he talks seeing him wilter up right in front of me. It was killing me. So fast forward three months later, November, he dies. I watch it. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm sitting there. It just, it, and now where I'm at, it made me a stronger man. But then it was like seeing mom tore up, watching him die, take his last breath. They zip him up in a body bag. Little bros here. You're like, man, what is going on? This is what life is about. So then you're already like, now, Maurice was my father, and he, you know, I got my butt whooped, right? He from former slave, stension core belts. I wouldn't say none of that, but he loved me, and it was out of, you know why I'm doing this, and then he'd tear your butt up, <laughs> and he would probably tear my friends up, too, and that's just black families, how he was back raised then. back yeah. then. We came you know, up like that. Yeah. You know, I ain't you doing know why that. I got to do this. You know why I got to do this. You're bad as hell. You're yeah. bad as hell. If you, you, you scream too out. loud, you're trying to let these people know. I'm whoop, I'm whoop you harder. If you don't scream enough, I ain't doing my job. Yeah. So what are we gonna do? Yeah, so, find the middle. So, sweet spot. It, they sweet made a strong sp the boy in my of an ass whooping. Pause. Oh yes. Yeah. Um, and it was hard for my Scandinavian white mother because she was raised that way. But so, anyways, so he dies. He dies, and it does something to me. Mm -hmm. It. I'm like I'm 12 years old. I'm six foot one. I'm big. Okay. I'm not letting nobody. Talk to me. My uncles couldn't help me. My grandfather was my best friend, a Scandinavian German guy, a Norwegian guy, Scottish. And we, we'll talk about him because he was a major influence, uh, influencer in my uh, life. But dad died. Mom was working. Okay. Business stuff had to keep rolling. Dad died, lost income, the house. Now she lost his insurance. Insurance is back then in 99 was $1,000 a month. Okay. Brother had braces going on. So you, I just, it was getting tight. It got tight. So then this is where I found myself, you know, getting away from sports and kind of getting myself into the streets. <clears throat> but I wasn't a street kid. I was raised by Maurice. You better not, boy, I'm a G. I've been a gangster, shot a shoot, shot up all that. You ain't doing none of that. I was SpongeBob SquarePants. Now I'm 13 years old. They can't tell me nothing. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to the north side. Now, now, now you can't tell me nothing. So I get in trouble at 12 years old. I get my first, I get in trouble. I was by myself a lot because mom had to work. I got a burglary charge. St there's a weirdo in the neighborhood. He was playing video games with the kids. I'm like, in my head, I'm like, why are you playing video games with the kids? Man, we're about to take all the video games. This was my dad. I was saying, I don't like you. I don't trust you. My dad died. This was my justification. Wait, my wait, 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 he, wait. He's wait. a grown ass man. Okay. Neighborhood guys. And we had these guys in the neighborhood. And so a lot wait, of kids wait, wait. talk about this. So wait. So wait. Yeah. You're 12 years old. 12 years old. Big, big homie Maurice just dies. 
dies. Messes with you. It messes with me. Now you're doing neighborhood vigilante work. Now this is what I'm doing. The potential pedophiles I have, oh, in the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah already fighting you're back You're playing then. video games with the little kids. So, so I'm, Something ain't adding up. I'm coming to snatch your video games out the house. That's how Mason got his first charge, right? <laughs> um, okay, look, look, this is exact. This is the reality, okay? Um, um, I have 10 homeboys. I have 10 homeboys in the neighborhood, okay? Mm. Mason sets it all up, okay? This is where I, my first interaction with police is because I never interacted with police before. And ironically, police help m save my life. And the people don't know this relationship with police and myself and which why I have a criminal justice degree was I got in trouble, got the burglary. I had to do STS. Okay. This is my first interaction with police, law enforcement, anything. Right. Burglary, felony. Right. <laughs> the first one. Um, everybody snitched on me in the neighborhood. All the kids' parents said, you can never hang out with Jonathan again. Right? <laughs> and they all did still after. But um, I learned a lot from there. And so the police that arrested me the first time, Phil Johnson, he was a Crystal Police Department guy, laid my mama down, laid us all down, and was like, oh, you're going to jail. My mom passed her because we have a church. So Dad Maurice, okay, let me back up. Dad Maurice, but my mom, they started a church called Power Source Ministries. It's still over in Brooklyn Center, Christian non-denominational. Um, started a church, still running today. Um, my stepfather said Don Sam Don Donald Samuels, not Don Samuels, Donald Samuels, um, is the pastor with my mom. Um, and so, so we had the church dynamic. I had that growing up. So my mom's a pastor. She's like, hey, look. I'm a pastor. My son knows better than this, you know, and my justification, I wasn't telling the police, oh, dude's a weirdo. He's 50 years old playing with 10 kids, video games all day, and he has Playboys laying around. And I'm like, he's a little funny, but he ain't do nothing, but he was a little too funny for us. So that's why I'm hitting his house <laughs> and I'm taking all the video games. They knew it was us because we took all the video games, not cash and money, <laughs> um, but I take all the video games. Took the okay. Nintendos. Hey, I got back from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and right when I pulled up in the driveway, we were driving 14 hours in the police pull up, up oh, your son committed burglary. So this is my first interaction with police. Mm -hmm. Um, I learned a lot from it. I was like, Oh, my life can dramatically change. Everybody turned on me. No one thinks everybody thinks I'm a bad kid, all this type of stuff. So Jonathan gets on the straight and narrow, just making sure no more snitches go around me. Um, no, this really what it was. I just would tell everybody, Hey, look. If you're going to tell me, we can't be doing something. <laughs> and and they're like, all right, I'm not hanging out with you. So I was, I was. Because they were snitches. They were snitches. I was, and I was angry, right? But I was always, like you said, the hey, vigilante. Hey, man, wait, wait, stop, man. I can't, I can't, hey, I can't keep in a conversation. If you're going to take me serious that deep. And then make it funny like that. I do it all the time. But it's just the reality. You uh, can't hang out with Jonathan if I you're snitches. I told you. If you're going to tell on me, you can't hang with me. All right, I'm not hanging with you then. Yeah, yeah. Y'all are some snitches. Jefferson went the other way. <laughs> <laughs> I love my brother to death. He, when me and him went on a different, we went on two different paths, and we're going to talk about that okay. briefly too. Yeah, but, go ahead, go ahead. Because um, we, we got to, we, we're running on time. No, 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 not we're even good. close. We're okay, good. good. So dad dies. I start doing vigilante trouble work, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I'm always getting in trouble. Um, so I'm getting in trouble. I get in a whole bunch of fights. You know, I've been in probably 150, 200 fights just because the race component. So this is another piece that we have to talk about. So my dad, my dad, GD for the Lord, God disciple, changed it from his ways, grew up in the 50s and 60s, picking lion, remember? So he does have that mindset of he never cared about race. Mom is a white woman, blind hair, blue eyes, right? Mm -hmm. We don't treat nobody different, Okay. And don't let nobody treat you different. And if you do, punch them in their mouth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then now, my dad's dead now. Now I'm punching everybody in their mouth. You better not. You can't tell them grownups all the way down to my age, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody was getting punched in the mouth, right? My, and I was getting in trouble, okay? And But it was me always getting in trouble for, you call me the N-word, I knocked you out. And then I hurt you. Right. And I was doing that. And I would, and the police would be like, Jonathan, okay, what's the problem this time? Okay. Phil Johnson, really, and this is where it hit me. Crystal Police Department, I'm 15 going on 16 years old. I'd knock somebody out, really almost kill him. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, almost kill him. Mm -hmm. 
hit them in the wrong spot. Me and my buddies, we hit them in the wrong spot, almost did something to them. Now they say, Jonathan, there's one, one major factor in everything, and it's you, okay? You're just, and every time we come to you, you're justifying why you're doing this behavior. And it's almost legit, but what you do is go two for overboard. And it hit me. Okay. Just because somebody says the N-word to you or do something, you can't just crunch them, especially in this society. And I didn't know this word. And when I ran up on a police officer when I was about 15, and I said, this grown man is calling me the N-word. And the police officer, I don't believe you. It hit me. I was like, something ain't right. Something just ain't right. I want to be a police officer. I keep getting in trouble. I'm a vigilante. I'm punching people for calling me the N-word. I'm getting in trouble. Some ain't, some ain't working. Some ain't right. I get, I'm getting burglary charges for on the pedophiles. I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting. I'm getting out. I'm getting, in, I'm getting assault charges on races. I, what is going on, Jonathan? Royce is coming back to the studio here shortly. But, hey, hey, so uh, this is the Jonathan Mason show coming soon. The, the city of Minneapolis, if you tuned in now, mornings with Mason. Um, but, oh, so we have vigilante justice, Jonathan. I say, you know what? I'm changing this whole dynamic. I'm going to get very educated. I'm going to become a police officer. I'm going to become a lawyer. I'm going to get my degree. Okay. I do wonderful in high school for the most part. I get a 4.0 at the end. I end swell. Now I'm in 12th grade. I'm playing sports, played football, could have got a scholarship, but I was like, man, I seen past sports kind of really back then. So I told myself, you know what? Welcome back to the man. That Welcome so back funny. to funny. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so I would tell myself, you know, get, stay out of trouble. Okay, vigilante Jonathan is gone. Let's let's get it on in order. We're going to college. Do it the right way, Jonathan is. Do born. it the right way, right. And, and 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 they said, Jonathan, you and they always told me you'd be so powerful. You're such a smart guy. Natural born leader. Natural born leader will go into every belly of the beast and mm -hmm. be willing to not come out of the belly of the beast mm -hmm. just because I'm just genuine. And I seen Maurice tell me. Six months, I'm going to be dead and you going to handle it. So my view on death, it ain't bad, baby boy. I'm getting a body here, <laughs> okay? So it was a different home. feel. I'm going home to, to, I'm going I'm home. Home to Christ. And, and the day that I actually seen him die, which a lot of people, I watched him die. Actually, God gave me the opportunity to be able to be with him. And, and I can tell this story because it was a huge day in my life was the day before he died, uh, November 19th of 99, I stayed home the whole day. I never did this in my, ever in my life, right? Stayed home the whole entire day. And my mom woke me up at about, or at about four in the morning. She said, I got it from here. So just stay home this day, Jonathan. So this is another reason why I have PTSD about getting woke up. I fall asleep at four o'clock. At eight o'clock that morning, my dad was saying, weird stuff. My mom was screaming. I wake up. She, Jonathan, wake up, wake up, wake up. Your dad is going. So I'm talking, listen to him. He's saying, I see you, Lord. I see you, Jesus. I see you. He, this is what he's saying. And he sits there and he falls back. And that's it. He closed his eyes. I don't see him. So I'm sitting up there. My mom's crying. My brother, I'm trying to get Jefferson here. I'm calling to school as a 12-year-old. Get my brother here. My dad's about to die. Da, da, da. I've got people sending, going to go get him. I'm traumatized, right? I wake up. I'm out of a nap. I'm like, oh, my gosh. What? I stayed up all night. I got three hours of sleep. I'm 12 years old. Mom screaming. Last time I ever see my dad talk, he gone. Okay. Now, this is where my concept of death and all that come in. You know, obviously, we all have genuine fears of death but really i'm like i'm always been the guy like we all gonna go through it so like i guess we gonna have to go through it at my time and i'm not gonna worry about it it's gonna be at that time whenever it is because my dad never had a clue shootouts chicago shot up comas vietnam, vietnam dies of cancer crazy <laughs> it's just, oh, okay whatever <laughs> and so that so that's so this is why I always have that passion to be like, we got to keep going. Got to go, 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 go. And even with you, it's like, what's next? What's going on? And that's natural. I am. I can become too much for people sometimes because I'm like, 
bro, we're going to die one day. We got to go. And we got to make the change that we need to make, right? And I think myself, all of us, it should have that empowerment in themselves to be, I can help change this dynamic of the situation of the world. That's why God put us out here. Now, vigilante Jonathan goes to college. Okay. Goes to college. Wants to be a police officer. Criminal justice, criminality, love it. Uh, burglary at 12 years old. Trust me, I got this down, okay? So go to University of Wisconsin Stout, uh, out in Menominee. Um, everything's going good. I have a girlfriend at that time, you know, girlfriends, but girlfriend, um, and said, you know what? Let me just figure it all out. Let me, I want to, my mom is a pastor. Hey, we're not having no sex before marriage, right? I'm not perfect. I did. But uh, get married. Whoever it is, get married. That's right. So I had uh, my first wife. Um, we got married, had two children. Um, and, you know, I got my degree in criminal justice. I started working in the school. Okay. So this is now Jonathan who went from, I'm, uh, I've been in the community as a young kid growing up north. And so when I was running around, I was running over north. Running with the one nines and everybody else in the city, um, and this is when I was getting in trouble. And still, was no snitching around this time. Still kept no snitches around me, so I never got in trouble. <laughs> uh, and then when I got eighteen, I said, "You know what? I'm done. I'm not going to steal. I don't like thieves. I don't like none of this stuff. We're not doing nothing. I'm all straight and narrow. You won't catch me doing nothing. Still to this day, I'm not doing nothing. Bad. Just stay focused on what I got to do. This is where when I start." Focusing in on what I need to be doing, I started to feel the real pushback of the regime, of whatever globalism is. What is this evil entity? You mean like when you're working in the school? Working in the school, but just being more aware of. Just more focused on the real world. On the real world. Versus this little bubble of. Of my little. And, and just the whole neighborhood dynamic. Everybody Once tells you, you get you're going to be dead in tw yeah, 25. Dead in no, dead in jail before 21. Before 21, yeah. Yep. And if you make it to 25, you're OG in the black community. And as legitimate, it sounds crazy, it is. When I turned 21, even I was married and all this, I was like, thank God. <laughs> I'm a black man who made it to 21. Like, it's an achievement for black men. I'm like, sad. It, it's sad, but you ask a lot of many black men, they're going to say, I made it to 21, made it to 25, and people are looking at you like, are you insane? What are you doing for you to do that? And then I had to think about like, Nothing. I'm really. I'm actually not doing nothing. You're right, and that is a. It gives you a um a sense of anxiety, mm -hmm. um, um, anxiety for sure. I remember graduating. I remember graduating high school, and thinking, "Wow." I mean, you did. Yeah, no. Graduating high school is a is a huge achievement for young yeah. black men, not just because of the the dropout rate, right. in Minneapolis right, or St. Right, Paul, right. which is huge, like huge. fifty percent, huge, something crazy. And even when we were growing up, it was way worse. No, it was it was bad. No, it's it's bad now. It's, yeah. Now, now. No, they're just not proficient in reading the map. Yeah, they now, can't even now read. Now they're just passing you. Yeah. Well, you can't pass Perfect. anything. Before, you used to actually have to stay back a grade. Right. And then if you got killed back a grade, people dropped out because they didn't want to be teased. Clowned. And then the liberals used that to justify passing people through grades without being able to read. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. we got a huge problem there. But when I when, when I was coming up, when I was uh coming up, um. Even when I graduated high school, I remember just thinking, being emotional during a ceremony. Right, me too. Not not because it's like school. No. Not because I had achieved 12 years of school. It was like, it was because I had survived. And so, I knew so I knew so many people who didn't survive. And died. Like, we yeah. actually know people yeah. who have died yeah. at a young age. Chris Little, um, I, uh, B. Cole. Bunch of them. Oh, uh, yeah, Brian. Bunch of Cal, yeah. Cal, you know, yeah. uh, Cal yeah. Parker. Yep. Uh, it, was a, it was a bunch uh, of them. You know, Jordan Hughes. Mandela, oh, you know, a bu bro. bunch of them. I mean, the list goes on and on. And, you know, whether which side of what anybody was on, that's 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 a conversation. Right. Not, Another not one we'll have. For on air, but, but you know, right. you, you, and, and that actually had the, the, the last, the Jordan thing happened when I was in college on my way to the NBA. And I remember that one because I was just getting done with my basketball season. Right. And, um, you know, there's all this talk about me being drafted and I'm excited about that, obviously. I mean, when you're a young black kid and you make it 
to your 18, your senior graduation. You're the best basketball player in the state, one of the best in the country, and you're getting emotional because all black young men don't make it to graduate. And here, it's kind of what they call uh, um, survivor's remorse. Yes, exactly. Psychological. Yeah, psychological. And and even sometimes it's just a perception. Mm -hmm. But when you're that close to the neighborhood and you grow up in the neighborhood, it's, it's real. Right now, if you're, it's not for all black people, right? Because all black people don't really have the attachment to the neighborhood or the awareness or experience with with tragedy like that and death to be able to to be able to feel that. Yeah, correct. But we do. Yeah, we do. We feel that. Yes, and it's 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 actually something that I feel like God's prepared us for now, where the survivor's remorse is no longer. I'm going to have a successful high paying corporate job and my black friends can't come with me or I'm going to get to the NBA and my black friends can't come with me. It's I'm awake to what's going on in the world, but some of my black friends are still caught up in the neighborhood, in the neighborhood bubble. Right. And now every day, bro, I'm seeing every day. They're waking up. My inbox is bing, bing, bing. It's and like by a, those, the ones that we wouldn't leave behind that they wanted us to always leave behind. Oh, that's why I got in trouble at the University of Minnesota. I, I'll tell that story right now. Yeah, do it. I I'll need t- you to do, do it right now. Yeah. I'll tell that story right now. Yes. I love that Pause one. Pause on your story. Yeah, because I got You're in lot. college. You're yep. in college. You're going to start seeing the liberal, the liberal uh, agenda. The liberal agenda. At the same time, no, I'm a little bit younger than you at this point time. But well, hold on. No, no, no. Actually... No, when you're, 23, no, 23. You're 23 at Stout. I'm you're 19, 18. 18. Yeah, 18. you're right there. right there. You're right there. Yeah. Same time, right across the way. Yeah. I'm running into the liberal agenda. So, and, and I'll tell my story. I had no problem telling it. Because when I say I really come from the from it. Yeah. You come from it. And I and you know what? As the people, the people that watch me talk, that see it around the world or around the country, mm-hmm. they wouldn't understand it. They wouldn't understand just how ridiculous it is for some of these white liberals and even some of these bourgeois Negroes to talk the way they do about Uncle Toms and Coons right? because they weren't even invited where we come from. Right, period. They can't even talk. They can't come We didn't around. let them. They, You couldn't even talk. You didn't even feel confident Actually, to you talk. went over to hang out with the white liberals because you couldn't talk over here. And we let you because we're not worried about that stuff. Right. Because the, the neighborhood dynamic is a whole different jungle. A whole different You bubble. have to survive this jungle. You don't have time. And this is the big problem with p- politics in black America is that there is a certain level of undue pressure and just a, a, a psychological turmoil and chaos that, that exists in the black community that doesn't really, or even just being a poor, yeah, that doesn't allow you to really deeply concern yourself with being a citizen. Right. See, the people who are a little more affluent, right. they get to go on this little, this, this, We'll call it a, a, an intellectual amusement park. Right. A little merry-go-round. Right. It's fun. We don't have time for I get that. to contemplate life, right. right? When you live in the day-to-day hustle and bustle, uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not so easy to do so. Now, those of us who come from it and found time to do that, the Malcolm X, who used to be a Detroit Red, was a pimp in Detroit and came from Omaha, where my grandfather came from, people who came out of that right. and have that experience usually end up being the most prolific Leaders, because right. they can speak to the, the the philosophical, but they can actually speak to how it how it plays out in the belly of the beast. No, Royce can go to the north side right now, or Wyzetta. Uh, not and, to say, not to and, say, and, I couldn't and, get and, shot and, on the north side. No, but if I'm getting shot, it's because it, it, it's not it's it's not it's for a different reasons. But what I'm saying, psycholo- no, philosophically, you could go to the north side, interact in regurgitate information that you got elsewhere right. and, and relay it to them right. seamlessly. Right. And you can go to YZ right on the same highway, 55, all the way down there and intellectually speak to those Absolutely. in the same neighborhood. And, that's, and makes, that's why we're we're dangerous. Dangerous. Very dangerous. To, to the unit party. Yes. Not just the Democrats. <laughs> to the, <laughs> to the, uni- to the uni- establishment uni- rhinos too. Correct. <laughs> right? Because we can see right through it all. Yeah. You know, to the Rob Smiths of the world. You know, the Finocchios who get online, who talk like liberal white women with pink velvet, crushed velvet polos on in Miami penthouses, right? These right. type of these type of black Republicans. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. N- n- no. Not real. It's just it's just not real. You know, nobody's buying it. Nobody believes you. And the neighborhood knows you're not from there. They, nobody believes. So my, my point is, yeah. I can tell, tell the story because the people who matter, see, the politics and citizenship, 
is circles, you know, a, a layer, layers of concentric circles. The and really, let's frame the conversation up around the University of Minnesota because I will. Really, no, I'm saying the global to the yeah. local, yeah. right? Your citizenship in politics is from global to local. Period. Now the global affects the local. We we we. I ran a campaign saying, and we'll continue to run campaigns emphasizing that the global does affect the local. When they go to ship your jobs in China, and your young black men don't have work and trade jobs, and then they teach your young black men through radical material, uh, affluent, yuppie, posh, liberal education that having a trade job is is some type of dishonorable or disreputable thing, shameful right. thing. Right. Yeah, the global affects the local. Right. Right. And now right. they're yeah. robbing people to go get that money to live that radical. Now they're robbing Gucci you. purses from, from now they're from, robbing from, you from Finocchio Italian designers. You see what goes around comes around. Right. Uh, okay, I digress. My point is, I could tell the story about the U of M. I come up as a city, a, a citywide kid, right? Twin Cities, St. Paul, Minneapolis, very close, very unique metropolitan area to anywhere in the country. It's why we have Minneapolis, which only has four hundred thousand people in it. But the Twin Cities metro area is the 15th biggest metropolitan area right. in the country. Right. It's because the city never stops. No. I mean, it just goes and on our forever. Sub suburbs are it goes on forever. Right there. Okay. So I grew up across the Twin Cities. St. Paul, families from Rondo. St. Paul roots, family came from St. Paul, born and raised three, four generations. West Side, Mexican family, helped build the West Side, Our Lady of Guadalupe. My Mexican family is more Catholic than my than my than my black family. Right. My black family's Catholic, but my Mexican family's Catholic Catholic. Okay. Real Catholic. The Mexican Catholics are even go harder. Our Lady of Guadalupe, when my grandmother dies, there's two thousand, three thousand people on the Cesar Chavez but now it's Cesar Chavez Boulevard to honor her death because she helped build the church. Right. And she also helped settle Mexican immigrants right. back in the sixties, fifties. Grew up on the east side. Friends on the east side, went to school downtown St. Paul. Closest middle school, public school was on the east side, up on Arcade and Payne. Now, if anybody knows anything about the east side, right. the north side is bad. East side's right but there with the it. The east side is a dirty, grimy drug. It's, it's a lot of people from Chicago there, too. It's a drug. I mean, you're talking about crackheads and drug deals. I mean, it's right. You go to Payne and Arcade. Pimping, it, prostitution, all of it. It's as grimy as anywhere else. Right. It, Almost grimy in a in a worse way. It's because yeah. it's, it's a poor grimy. It's, it's a nasty. It's, it's just a big it's city gr old grimy. Yeah. Yes, you know it's like being in New York City. But then if you go to upstate to Buffalo, yeah, right, right. Like the Buffalo grimy, grimy is, a is even different. worse. It's yeah. just something off about it. Yeah, you know? right. So you know, grew up on the east side. Had friends on the east side. Played on the east side. Grew up playing basketball on the north side. Right. Grew up playing basketball on the north side. My all my young years. Right up until you know eighth grade, seven, all your eighth friends grade. were from the city. All my friends were from all over the city. Right. Grandfather was the director of recreation and parks, Mr. White in Richfield, Frank White. Frank White, yeah. Great man, had his life together, well organized, not street, not hood, but a figure in the community. Everybody knows him. So I, when I'm going to the neighborhood, I'm going with my grandfather. Right. Who they have this respect for is Mr. White, Frank White. Everybody knows him, a, a Hall of Fame referee. Yeah. But they had this respect for him and know that it's not nothing criminal related. Right. But then I got uncles in the family that were pimping from West Coast to East Coast. Right. I mean, that's right. just, it's the, just the dynamic. It's the dynamic, you know, and, and you learn a little bit from everybody. You take a little bit from everybody. But so by the time I get to college now, by the time I get to college, I'm the number one player in the state. I'm the number two player in the country. And the energy from everybody who I grew up with across an entire Twin Cities community is coming with me. Right. And if you know anything about the University of Minnesota, which if you're listening, you may not know, but if you go to Minneapolis and you find yourself on University Avenue, University Avenue will run you straight through Minneapolis and through St. Paul. In through the U. It connects, the, and the university smack dab in the middle. Right. So if you're from St. Paul or you're from Minneapolis and you want to get to that campus, all you got to do is get on University Avenue and follow Bingo. And, and go take a ride 10 yep. minutes yeah so when i got to campus you know there was a lot of hype because me and rodney this was the first this was tubby smith's first year and me and rodney williams and it was such controversial because you stayed many times people left at right. your caliber and you say. stayed yeah. local and stay loyal to minnesota yeah that's what i was going to say for the it, it was it we were the first big recruits that stayed home in a long time 
Right. Since Chris Humphreys and, Chris before, Humphrey. and before Chris Humphreys, there weren't many either. Either. So you know, it was it was not you. It was not common for recruits that high level to stay at the University of Minnesota. Right. So there was a lot of excitement, not only from the University of Minnesota fan base, but from the entire city. Because right. we were hometown kids. Right. right. I knew I was happy when I remember. I was like, Royce is staying day. And you know, I never even took a visit. That's how loyal I was. And you got to maybe talk about that story about you just seeing Tubby and just That's how him. loyal I was. Well, I, well, yeah, I'll tell that story. Well, one, I was at De La Salle. Right. And getting coached by Dave Thorson. Dave Thorson used to be a college coach himself before he became a high school coach. He coached with Clem Haskins at the University of Minnesota. And then went to De La Salle. Then he came to De La Salle before Clem and everybody got in trouble at the U. Right, right, right. right? Yeah. Which now, ex post facto, we look at what happened with Clem Haskins and we realize what he did then wouldn't even be considered illegal today. Now, right. So, I mean, that that was a whole different era and a whole different time. They got to make that go right. Into that. They should make that right, but but they probably won't because we have trouble recon reconciling the past when our laws and things have been out of date or obsolete. That goes well beyond basketball, but certainly a good example. So, you know, Dave Thorson comes from the college basketball world. I had the, the, the I was blessed to be able to come up through De La Salle. Right. So now I'm at a Catholic private high school, one of the most right. prestigious schools in, in the state of Minnesota. Yeah. And Maybe, definitely in the Twin Cities, for de- sure. Oh, for sure in the Twin Cities. Rich, rich Catholic history. You're talking to Christian brothers, Father Hennepin. I mean, this goes all the way back to the initial Catholic roots. Right. And, and so now I'm getting that dynamic. But there's a lot of black kids that go to De La Salle. As far as Christian private high schools goes, De La Salle is one of the blackest there is. Yeah, there is the, that's the blackest. That there. is the blackest, yeah, right? right? I mean, Benil, no. No. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Visitation St. Thomas, no. no. You know, this is a black right. private high school. So I'm coming up with Dave, and 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 so I get big. And and at the time, Don Dan Munson, who I thought was a great coach, and I respect him, love Dan Munson. Shout out to him wherever he is right now. I think he's still coaching. Wish him luck uh, this coming season if he is. But but Dan Munson is the first one to offer me. I'm a I'm a sophomore. Couldn't officially offer me, but we want you. Right. right. If everything goes well, we we, we want you. Right. <laughs> right. We, we know, right? Um, but the consensus was nobody Minnesota can't get him. He's too good. I mean, he's going. I had the pick Kentucky's, of Kentucky's, Kansas's, UConn, UConn, North Carolina. I'm gonna tell the story about Dukes. North Carolina in in a second. So, you know, and my recruitment's running through Renee Pulley, who's the godfather of the basketball community here, yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. Right up there. I mean, him and my grand, him and my. So you, yeah, I think between Dave Thorson, my grandfather, and Renee Pulley, I'm involved with the basketball. Everything. The mount. The, the godfathers of the the Minnesota basketball community. Game. Right. Right. So they're handling recruitment for the most part. I'm not even here. I'm I'm just going out balling, and I had a chip on my shoulder. I mean, I was a I was I was uh, uh, I had grown up throughout Minneapolis so so much, and I had watched certain kids I come up with not be able to have the same opportunities as me mm-hmm. or success. So I still had that survivor's remorse already because mm-hmm. I saw, okay, my my friend here didn't make his seventh grade team. He started smoking weed and hit the streets. I'm gonna go hard for him. Because I think he could have been. Oh, you had all type of chips on your shirt. Yeah, I was going, I was stupid. I know. You know, but that's what made me a little different. A little different, right? Right. So when we're out there playing Compton Magic in Kansas, or we're out there playing a a, a Boo Williams at Boo Williams, or we're playing the Gauchos at at Rumble in the Bronx or wherever it is, I'm like, I don't give a fuck where you're from. Minnesota, we going down there. Minnesota or nothing. Right. 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 So, so, you know, I'm building up this, this profile as a young high school player. And I'm not even really aware of the the college thing until it gets hot when it comes time to make a decision. Right. And and so um, I remember it's my junior year. I get dismissed from De La Salle for cheating on a test with my teammates. Right. They said we had a zero tolerance policy around cheating on tests. Right. And that, you did cheat. Yeah, I cheated. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. We, I mean, we was we was cheating on the test. Uh, yeah. I mean, but that goes into deeper because. <laughs> Y'all letting the athletes do whatever anyways well, at but, these uh, universities. Uh, no, but, but, but you should have been cheating anyways. No, but. I shouldn't have been cheating on the test, but but the but to be quite honest about the whole deal, um, it it does it does speak to because you know, people look at me now and they go, one of the one of the compliments of me across the board is right. intelligence. Yeah, well, intellectual. Yeah, you're a smart guy. So you gotta think about how degraded the education must be. 
I don't care if you're at private school or public school, how degraded the, the education must be by liberalism yeah. that people who become intellectuals in our society are completely un uh, uh, are completely uninterested in, that, in scholastics while they're in school. Yeah, and that's Me the story too. for most people. Me too. Well, that's because they're teaching liberalism. Right. They're not teaching life. They're right. not teaching politics. They're right. not teaching real shit. Because if it was real, I would have been interested. I would have loved it. Yeah, I love I'm history. Not. But just I'm tell not. me the truth. And my great friend AJ. One time we got to have me, you, and AJ oh, at the I same love time. AJ, yeah. AJ was a bl- he's he's a principal now. Had a has a master's. Is is getting his has his Who? principal certification. Okay, it, 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 as smarter than I am. Okay, he used to say all the time, "If I'm if I wake up and I'm tired, I'm not going to school. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm gonna get there when I get there. Like I'm not getting caught up in this racket." Now he was privileged enough to be able to do that to, to ha- drive himself to school. Right. Mom and dad, two parent house, both worked, both had decent decent you know and income. Had, yeah. So he had the the, the ability and to be able to do that. Right. But I just love his mentality. His mentality right. was like. Yeah, I'm smart. I think school's important, but if I'm tired, I'm tired. I'm not coming to school until I've gotten enough sleep. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's funny because you know it, it, it speaks. I was just is this total tangent. Kids went back to school this week, and uh, I got the school says schedule, and I'm looking at it, and it says nine to four o'clock. And I just thought to myself, for the first time in my entire, not the first time in my life, but when you're a parent, it really starts to hit you. Right. What the fuck are they doing with these kids up at school from nine to four? <laughs> I told you. It's a complete baby. Well, I remember what we were doing. But Indoctrination. School, but school wasn't as long when we were. It was two hours less. We got out at 2.15. Yeah, 2.15. But we 2:30. started at 6.30 or 7. No, we started. Seven. Where I was, we started about 8, 9. See? And we went to 2.15. Oh, that's love. That was De La Salle. Uh, De La Salle, no, maybe when I was there, De La Salle did oh, go to they That's us, high school. I'm I in was grade real public school. My son's in grade school, though. Okay, we're talking grade school now. We go from six to six in my school. <laughs> <laughs> it's because the moms are working two jobs. They had to. Okay, so okay, so that's a tangent. Yeah. But but so anyway, I'm exposed to De La Salle private school. I'm coming up through the school. I become a star athlete, and all of a sudden, I get dismissed from school. Heartbroken. Love right. Dave Thorson like the father I never had. Was the basketball season over or mid basketball season? In the middle of basketball. in the middle of the season. Sophomore year? AJ had just transferred over what to year De La Salle. Was... Junior. Junior year. AJ had just transferred over to De La Salle to play with me. And we were struggling in the beginning of that season, but we had found a rhythm. We were all right. You know, we were coming around the corner. I had a bunch of young boys with me now, because remember, my sophomore year, we had... we had just graduated. My freshman year, we graduated eight seniors. So I had the privilege to come up with, I hung with older guys. So they kept Cameron Rundles, Cam Rundles, Teddy, Joe Scott. They kept they kept me focused. They showed right. me work ethic. Okay, Joe on top Scott, of that's on boy, top Joe. of Dave Thorson. <laughs> Look at Joe. They showed me work ethic. Yeah. Right. They 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 taught me about culture. Right. Basketball culture. Right. Being a player. Being serious about it. So then they graduate. Now it's my team. Right. Sophomore year, we lose to Benil, Jordan Taylor, and them you know, in the battle. sections. Been, we lose to them in the sections. And then now it's my junior year. Now, while this all goes down, I'm number one in the state, number two in the country. Right. From the summer stuff. Right. Okay. So junior year, midway through, I get dismissed. Heartbroken. You know, had those first couple of days. I'm in tears. Right. I don't know what's going to happen. I think the I think my career's done. You because, done threw it away. And- you know, I didn't got kicked out of school. What the coach is going to think. And then one day it just it just hit me. I was sitting at home, and, and then, you know they were like, "Ela Sal told me, well, you could come back next year, you know," and just saying some weird stuff. And um, they kicked Dave, you out of school entirely. Oh yeah, dismissed me from school completely. Oh, not just from sports. No, from the whole school. Oh wow. Yeah, dismissed. Zero pollen, zero tolerance. For I, real. I guess. I mean, it seemed a little weird to me. You know, for cheating on a test, maybe there were other things that they were factoring in that I didn't really know about or hear about. But what you were told was the test. What I was told was the zero tolerance. Okay. Okay. They tell you you can come back. And there was a time, too, where I had a a pack of Oreo cookies uh, in in my uh, religion class, and my teacher thought it was was prudent to come and take my cookies off my desk and throw them in the trash can. Little Finocchio teacher, I almost got up and slapped him. I didn't. I went to his desk. I said, now, if I took your water bottle and threw it in the trash, that's disrespect, right? I'm not saying I'm an adult, but don't, you know, 
I, 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 matter right. of fact, to, to and be, you're six seven. Yeah, you know, but you know, it ain't even it ain't even that. It's just don't don't, cut, don't disrespect me. You like know, that. and first off, you know, it was even then. It was like which rules? Wh why are some rules prioritized and some aren't? Right? Is you uh, seen through it then? What are we doing here? I can, I'm I'm like AJ said. I'm tired. I'm sleepy. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Right. I we, want a snack. We practice six a.m. every morning. Now all of y'all are gonna come to the games, including the religion teacher, with his pom poms and, and clap like a seal when I'm dunking on somebody, and 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 jerk off to that. But I can't eat Oreos in the class because there's a rule about no food. Are you guys serious? <laughs> I mean, what's going on? This is ridiculous. Right? And then not only that, you're gonna transverse, you're gonna cross the Rubicon of not only taking them from me, which I think is wild, but you threw them in the trash. You ain't even put them up at the desk like here. You can get them after class. You just went straight to disrespect. Well, and maybe I'm throwing your shit it, away. there might have been some different between. Something could have been going on with him that day. Or no, I, he wanted to say, let me trigger Royce off and get him kicked out of school. Yeah, but no, that that didn't happen anywhere near each other. But there there was, you know, there were little things I could go back and point to. Anyway. Anyways. Point is, I get dismissed. I'm like, yo, I had already been going over to Hopkins, open gym, because right. my boys who I grew up with from the Hustler team, just like the boys who went to Cooper, right. three or four of them went over to Hopkins. Right. Raymond, Marcus. Yeah. Um, uh, Montez, Williams. A few of the boys from the north yeah, side ended up at Hopkins. Right. Okay. So, them are my boys. I mean, me and Marcus and Rodney go back to the third grade, to the to the yoke. Right. You know. So, it's, you said if I go to Hopkins, so, I'll be playing against Rodney and them in the nah, same district. Really, no, nah, because they're Cooper's in another district. They're not in the same conference as conference? us. No, nah, Cooper's not in our conference. Classic Lake? It used to be Classic mm -mm, nah, Lake. No, we're in the, uh, uh, we are in the. Used to be in a conference. Yeah, like, we're in a big uh, lake conference. Lake conference. They're in a, yeah. yeah. So, no, it wasn't that. It was just, these are my boys. Right. And I know Coach Novak because I've been coming up to Hopkins playing an open gym and Coach Novak's always sitting there. And my grandfather knew him well, right? So, Dave wanted me to ask. Which me, Novak, the dad or the Junior. Son, junior. Okay. But I knew senior too. Yeah. I mean, they always together. When right. but rest in peace to senior. Right. Yeah. We lost him last year. That was that was a, a rough one. But um, man, he was a special soul too. I love senior. I wish I wish he was alive today. I would love to be able to sit him in that chair and have people hear the things that he really thought and, and, and believed in because he's a special person. But um they were always together, so I knew right. him. Right. Right. Um and then Dave wanted me to go to Finley Prep. Finley Prep wanted me to come. Which is the big time prep school yeah, in Vegas? Vegas. But I was like, nah, I'm not. I don't want to do that. You right. Know, I'm not going to live in Vegas. I'm. I'm it's going too much around that. Really, it was. It was. I still got. I still got chip on my shoulder. Right. I got something to prove. Right. Because I hadn't won the state championship until my, since my freshman year. Right. Sophomore year, we lost in the section finals. Right. Junior, Junior year, year, I get expelled. Yeah. So I couldn't even play in the in the play postseason. So let me go get a dub. I'm going to get one. And I went to Hopkins, and we went thirty-one and zero. I know. I They're remember. Undefeated. It. I remember it. Only time in history since the re since the class since the the reclassing re of the of yep. the of the conferences, right? Yeah. One eight since the one two three four eight right. class structure. So now it's on, right? Not only am I number one kid, number two in the country, going staying home, but we just came off of being thirty-one and zero. Right. And if you know anything about. So you about, win a uh, state championship. You just won a state championship. So, and so if you know anything about the way communities work with high school sports, the things that are happening with the high school sports ring even even more in the community, community. than what's happening with any collegiate national prep. They don't know about the prep even, rankings. Even links. The, the, even when it would be mean? like the links win and then, but they know, uh, oh, this is Royce right here in the city. Film, it's community based. It's community based. I pull up on campus. And we got time. This is great. I, I, I got to tell this story. We pull up on campus, and it's a frenzy. I mean, the energy on campus is like out of a movie. So do you go out of June? A movie. Do you go June, July, Right early? away in summer school. Yeah. Passed my ACT good, though, but they, they had the little bridge program then where, right. you know, get you started in the summer, get you a few credits in case something happens in the winter and you fail a class, you won't be ineligible. Right. Right. Get you all acclimated. Right. Get you accustomed to college life. Right. College life is different than high school life. You're right. on your own. You're really on your own. Right. Now, I was already on my own throughout certain times in high school, so it really wasn't a big transition for me, but that's the idea. Right. 
we get to campus and it's a frenzy. It's a frenzy. I mean, and, and to me, it was like, yeah, come on. Yeah, of course you can come pull up. Of course you can pull up and, and come hop out and hang now, out with me. Now, these are your friends. From all over the city. So, no, 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 no. See, you skipped that little piece what? right there. You went, you got there, frenzy. You're on campus. Mm -hmm. it, every It's going down. Mm -hmm. And now the friends are saying, hey, look, bro, you're at you're at the university. Can we come down here and come What's up, bro? With what you? You? I want to come. I'm, I'm going to come holler at you. Brad I'm going to come hang with you. Right. And I'm like, please. Right. I ain't seen you in a minute. Right. <laughs> what were people, because I know the dynamic of mm -hmm. what that would look like, because, you know, we've been around this a lot. What were people telling you? Oh, I'm gonna tell. Let me tell you. Okay. So, guys coming down, and you know, back then I was, the, you know, me. I can't. I, I ain't always been the the, the most. Um, you got a little hood in you. Yeah, I got a lot. I know. I got a lot. And of, we know. And we know that dynamic I got a lot of in it me. too. I got a lot of it in me. You yeah. know, and, and I'm I thank God because yes. for times such as this. Because I'm certainly not scared to cuss out any liberal fucking Finocchios. Where I'm from, <laughs> Here he goes. where I'm from, we don't even let you motherfuckers talk. Period. Not not to be tyrannical. No. But we have this spiritual intuition that you're full of shit. Then you're I got not a, gonna get. I'm, I got a great full of shit, shit detector. Else. Right. I'm not full of shit. There are plenty of people in the neighborhood, in the community, that are that are in a circumstance that we all wish they wouldn't be in, and they make poor choices. Uh, but but a lot of them have a, a very good. Bullshit detector. Right. Facts. These are the same people who didn't take the fucking vaccine. We'll get there in a moment. We, we, but yeah, my, my we'll point is. So you're there. I'm okay. there. My friends are coming down. from. They're saying, let me come down. All, remember, I'm just leaving high school. I still got my friends from junior high. And D.L. is only, what, five miles away? Less literally, than, literally five minutes. Five minutes away. The, but right I'm University. saying, I still got friends from junior high who I just hadn't linked up with because I was in high school balling. Right. I still got childhood friends right. who I just ain't seen because I've been playing basketball year round. Yeah. And I'm fir finally getting like a, this is the first moment to kind of breathe. Right. Where I'm getting my feet under me. I got my own place. And people are like, man, I ain't seen you since. Remember the summer? Remember 05? Uh, uh, because you go from AU, high school basketball, AU. High school, back, AU, yeah, AU, high school, yeah, AU, AU. Back yeah. to back to back. All day long. For four years straight. Right. It's like an all year round thing. Once you hit ninth grade. Right. And you're number one. And two I'm number in the country. one. So I, when I'm not playing, I'm at the gym. I'm working out on my own. I'm at the house doing push-ups. You know, it's it's almost, it's not jail because it's the most beautiful thing you can spend your time on doing something you love and, and getting great at it. So I'm not going to say it's like jail, but I'm saying as far as the contact with people outside of that basketball bubble, you lose that. Right. And so now when I get to campus and these people are like, what you doing right now? Like, Nothing. I'm just sitting at the dorm. I just left the weight room. I'm muscle milked up. I'm walking around looking like an action figure. I'm he manned up, 260, mm -hmm. walking around campus looking at the football. Some y'all are little. You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah. Let's go to the weight room, see who could throw more on the bench <laughs> right. with the football team. Right. 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 So, you know, but I got time. I got a little time on my hands now. Right. And at the time, I'm, you know, I'm like little Van Wilder in me. Yeah. And, you know, I, got, I was you the life of the party. I'm yeah. like, I'm, 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 I like to have fun. And Keys was down there too with you. You know, Big Keys was down there with me and, and some other people as well. Point yeah. was, the campus became its, a, a life of its own. Yeah. It became its own thing. You know, it, it, it had an a, a, a energy of its, of its own socially for our age group. And you're talking about kids who maybe would otherwise not even be on campus. But right. now they're flooding in from all over the city. And it had this, this domino effect where now they tell a friend who tells a friend. So now you have this huge pool of people. Black people. Black, young teenagers, college age, who aren't students on campus but are coming for the social gatherings, right. which has always been allowed. And I was going to talk Hold on. It's you. always yeah. been allowed. Because it's always allowed. been it's allowed. It's always been allowed that you don't have to be from the college to come to another college's social gatherings, whether you're going to a bar down at the Drake Relays or, or you're going rat. to Visha at yeah. Iowa State. People come from all over the country to go to Visha, right, at right. Iowa State. So it's always been allowed. But for some reason, just too many. Right. Like, this wasn't ordinary, bro. I mean, one day I came out of my dorm on university at nighttime, and we had built such a party culture. We did. Just the energy of us being there was so big, the streets were completely filled. Mm. You no, know, it looked like a parade. And I only can imagine what the U is All young black teenagers. And I thought it was so 
well, let me let me get through the story and then I'll say what I think about the whole thing. Couple times, football players might have gotten into a fight with this guy here. Both drunk, talking, girl gotten, you know, girl involved. You try to talk to my girlfriend and blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, you know it's a fight. Right. And you know, the football players on any campus, mostly, but especially in a place like Minnesota, they football, stick together. They stick together, but they're also not from there. Right. Right. They come small hick town. They're or on scholarship from yeah, one of the wherever. football states. Yeah. Usually in the South, but yeah. you know, wherever they come from. They but there are a lot of them. So, right. So they roll around together. Right. Well, now they're running into crews of kids who are from here, right? Who from Minnesota, and and all of a sudden these little things are popping off over all over campus, and I'm getting calls about it. I'm getting called into the office and getting questioned about it. Like, well, a football player over here, you know, uh, this happened or this happened, and they said that they were your friends. I'm like. I'm from here. I I don't even know who you talking about. What's their name? I don't I don't even know that person. Number one, but I might know them. I know them from back when I was a kid. But I don't hang with them like that no more. I ain't telling them to come. <laughs> but to them, there was this sort of there was this sort of liberal. Remember now, we're talking the University of Minnesota academic administrations. The radical lefts. Radical left. Radical progress. This is where this is where DEI comes from. Right. The University of Minnesota. B belly of the Beast. Belly of the Beast. <laughs> <laughs> right. We call it the Belly of the Beast for multiple reasons. And that's okay? one of It them. ain't George Floyd. No. No, the University of Minnesota academic community is as liberal as they come. Right. I mean, radical liberals. Yeah. There was this sort of, there was this, there was this prejudice that all of us black kids were, were, were working together. We were, were, were coordinated. It's like a, a, a Rico. Right. Now they're coming to use that yeah. on President Trump. Yeah. It's like a Rico. This is like one big criminal organization. And I'm like, I ain't seen this kid since I was six. Right. Don't talk to him. This is before cell phones were even right. as, as instant as they are now. Right. You used to have to actually still call a person. Pay for minutes. If I'm... you had AIM, you were special. Right. If you had instant message, you were right. special. Oh. And you weren't even really AOL, on that. Right. You weren't really even on that. It was just cool to say that you had it. Maybe Sidekick. Sidekick, you used it a little bit. Right. But you weren't instant like you are today. Right. It wasn't like, oh, Facebook. Oh, I oh, I seen that. I, I ain't seen you in years, bro. Where you at? Where's the party at? It wasn't like that. Right. Now, this was still word of mouth. Word, word of, of mouth. Friend. Yeah. Okay. Word of friend. Yeah. So they're saying, Royce, you, you, know, you know these kids. These are your friends. I'm saying, well, they're not really my friends. But now since you say it, fuck it. They are with me. I mean, I got to the point where it was kind of like, I don't like what you're saying. Right. It's so, almost racially told. No, it ain't almost. It is. This is liberal racism. And right. this is why I said it to lead off to what you're going to talk about with your, with your awakening. Right. Because I noticed it well before anybody knew who I was on the national stage. I mean, I was known a little bit number two player in the country, but like they do now. Right. I really encountered liberal racism before Obama was ever elected. Right. <laughs> I, I right. Was, I was in the belly of the beast right. before the hope campaign. Right. Okay. Yeah. I don't like what y'all are saying. Right. Y'all are saying that these kids are with me because you know, they're not students and they're black. Right. I don't like that shit. Right. So eventually it got to the point where eventually it got to the point where the whole thing at the mall of America went down. Right. Uh, the little, little snatch and grab prank. Playing, remember, playing remember, around. You remember pranking. now, remember now a lot of people play pranks. I don't like that. They, now, when black kids are doing it, they're doing it like with a real economic motive. Motive, right? Like I'm going to steal a thousand dollar bag, and I'm going, I'm going to sell it and get the cash. Right. Back in the day, when me and you were that age, when we were younger, high school, people be playing pranks to really be funny. Oh yeah, we grab the bag, run out and see if y'all chase us, and then come bring it back. We or came up it. under the jackass era. Right. Right. Remember right. jackass? Yeah. These weren't black people. No, it was white boys. Yeah, with that, pranksters. and that yeah, pranksters. Okay, so we came up in that generation, right? right? Good, a good prank is a good laugh, right? Right. Now, this one looting. Now looking back on it, a lot of those pranks are crazy as hell. You letting an alligator bite your 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 wiener. Steve O right. was a trip. Steve O was. But a... but we came up in that generation. So anyway, it got to the point where they suspended me. I'm gonna tell you this story within a story. We got time. Tell a story within a story. Get in trouble with the Mall America situation. They suspend me. Two games, uh, I forget. it was like maybe week suspension or something like that. But it wasn't no big deal because I only, I mean, it was like a, I got a disorderly conduct came out of it, right? Right. 
Three weeks later, I'm at the campus in a dorm. Big party, freshman dorm. Big, big party, freshman dorm. And there's five of them in one little complex. So people are running in and out of different dorms, just, you know, going level to level. It's like seven, each one's seven floors. Mm -hmm. And a girl gets her laptop stolen. Okay. Now, the laptop gets returned to her. Somehow, somebody returned this laptop to her on by the following Monday. I didn't even realize this had happened yet. Right. I get a call later on in that week. Remember now, her laptop's been returned already. I get a call from an investigator with the University of Minnesota Police Department saying, we need you to come down. We need to ask you some questions. Mm -hmm. And you know me at the time. I'm already, I'm already not liking that a bunch of people are saying you can't hang with these kids that come from the neighborhood because it's going to ruin your economic opportunities. I was already fighting radical materialism then. Right. I don't like that shit. Yeah, and from the neighborhood, in the context of the community is if, like, back in the day, if you try to go to the club and they wouldn't let one of your homeboys in, like, we all ain't going in. We're not going we in. We don't leave one of your homeboys. Not, so not, that's the mentality Not that for something had. superficial. No, hell no. Yeah, and to Nothing, me. Yeah, to, you leave your homeboy for But to like me, that, whatever they were offering me at the university, whether it be a scholarship or some professional basketball career, wasn't worth my sacred honor. Right. Now, I didn't know how to articulate that at the time. And I def definitely didn't know how to articulate it to my other 18 and 17-year-old friends. But that was the spirit of what I you was. You felt what it was. I felt it. I right. just didn't know how to articulate it yet. Right. And there's a problem with not being able to articulate it. Right. But that not being able to articulate it stems back to the way we're educated. Right. Because 60 years ago, the 18-year-olds could articulate it already yes. at 17. Fred Hampton. There you go. Yeah. Right. From Chicago. Now, in order to be Fred Hampton, you're probably not going until you're 30. Two. Two. Three. <laughs> because th and by that time, they Jesus you out. <laughs> you know, there you go. So, so I'm rejecting. I'm saying I'm not, I'm not going to not hang out with anybody because it's going to ruin my opportunity, especially since they're not actually doing nothing wrong. You just don't like their presence on campus. Right. Especially when y'all are running around doing African-American studies, acting like you like black people, but you only like the black people who are good enough to get in, to get accepted to the college. Right. You don't like the regular black people who aren't in the college. Right. Right? Right. I don't like that shit. <laughs> right, okay. me neither. So this investigator calls me. She says, come in. I jump up. Boom, boom. I put my pants on. I can't wait to go down there. I can't wait to get down to the department. Because to me, I'm like, first of all, I know I, I've not done anything wrong, but I want to hear what y'all, let me, let me see. Let me see what it's like. Let me see what the, how smart the police think they are. Right. I get down there. They sit me down in a room, and they're like, uh, yeah, we just want to ask you some questions. There was a laptop stolen, and, and your name came up. And um, we just want to, you know, uh, we want to show you some pictures. We want to show you some pictures of some individuals, and just if you could tell us something about them. They go to a folder, sitting there on the table. They're bringing out these still shots from security cameras and stuff like that. And um, they're like, you know this person? No. Do you know this person? No. Do you know this person? Is No, no, no. Don't know any of them. Don't know why you're asking me. Why are you asking me? Let's get, to, let's get to the point. Nitty gritty. Let's get to it. Let's just tell me why you're asking me. Well, you know, this girl's laptop was stolen from her dorm room. And when we came to que ask her questions, she's, we, we asked her, uh, uh, you know, who she thought stole the laptop. And she mentioned you and your friends. I said, well, first of all, I didn't steal a laptop. I don't need to steal a laptop. I got a laptop. And, and my friends, they know better than to act like that. We've been on campus all summer, and we haven't had any illegal incidents. None whatsoever. And when, that we haven't gotten in any trouble. And we actually hadn't gotten in any trouble right. other than some noise complaints for parties. But it wasn't any. That's everybody. But it wasn't anything illegal right? right? In, in, in that sense. If, if, first off, you get noise complaints at a college campus like the U of Standard. M. Somebody's being an asshole. Come on. We, <laughs> when I hear the people, when I hear, th when I hear three girls screaming next door at my dorm and it's my neighbor, I just give them a high five through the wall, right? right. It's like, g g way to go, buddy. Right. Get after it. You know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not calling the fucking campus police. R.A. Like, <laughs> the R.A. <laughs> 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 you know, John, John's at it again. There he uh, goes. Like, come on, man. And don't we, tell him I'm calling. Yeah, come on. What are, we doing? what are we doing? So when I was 18, okay, that was when I was 18. Let's right. be clear. But, um. 
So, so I'm in the room and I'm like, let's, let's just get to it. She's like, well, we think you had something to do with this. And I was like, I had nothing to do with it. And in fact, I'm glad this is all being recorded. I'm looking up at the camera over my shoulder and it's, you know, it's being recorded. I'm glad it's all being recorded because one day you're gonna have to say you apologize when you find out that there's, that I had nothing to do with this. No, we know. I, and then she got personal. It was a woman. Right. First of all, they're letting women be lead detectives, white liberal women right. being lead detectives right. at the campus police department to investigate black criminals. See how they do that? Same white woman that'll be out there saying, say his name. She might not because she's a police no. officer. Right. But y'all yeah, don't know. No, pride, and you'll see her at the pride. <laughs> oh, you're all for sure. With a, with a skimpy cop outfit on. It's really reality. So I, <laughs> I say, okay, well, we'll see. You know, we'll see. Am I under arrest? Do you need me for, for anything else? Am I, am I under arrest? No, you can go. You're free to go. Okay, great. I get up, I leave. The girl whose laptop was stolen calls and says to me, because we, we knew her. Right. I mean, we're, we lived in the dorm. It was like, right, we were all partying. Her laptop came up and she, she got to say something. It's not like we didn't know her. Right, right. She was like, listen, I, and, and her mom called. Her mom called with her. She was like, listen, we just want you to know that the police came to us and they asked specifically who was in the dorm that didn't live on your floor? Who did you see on your floor that didn't live on your floor? They didn't ask them, who do you think stole your laptop, like they told me. They said, who was there that didn't live there? And they said, well, Royce had some friends that, doesn't, that didn't live here. And that's what they used to, to identify me as a possible suspect mm. in this case. Mm. Now, the case goes to the district attorney. The district attorney is allowing the University of Minnesota Police Department to, f to finish their investigation before they will close the case and allow the University of Minnesota to let me return to play. Mm. Joel Maturi, who was the AD at the time, said, I'm not letting them play until this is completely taken oh. care of. So they dragged the thing out. And guess what they came back and charged me with? What? Trespassing at the dorm. Wow. They, See, and that and, that, they and came black back, men are dealing with this athletes. They came back and charged me with trespassing at the dorm I lived at. Should have sued him. I wasn't interested in shit. Like I know, that I know time. you didn't care, but yeah. I'm saying this is the only thing that's the only thing I could, but 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 on the on the flip side of that though, I had moved out of the dorm, moved to an apartment, which is considered off campus housing, but I was on campus. Right, right. And um, I was living in an apartment, and they were putting undercovers outside my house. They was put. You, we we could so almost like as if they were trying to set you up or no, they were, no, they or, weren't trying. They knew that I was connected to people from the streets who were real individuals. You know, people who had real track record, who had real power. They could have disrupted that. or interrupted your life's path to a degree where. But that's not even, yes, they could But you know that. what I mean, though? But that's not the important part. The right, important no. part is that white liberals, especially from the academic community, especially the higher-ups in the academic community, right. pretend like they're doing all of this, all of this humanitarian, uh, 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 you know, altruistic work on behalf of black people, particularly black men who have had trouble with the law. But as soon as those black people get a little too close to their comfort zone, oh, all of a sudden they want to bring the ax down on them. And, and I experienced that firsthand. And after that, I just said, hey, look, I'm out of here. Right. Because I'm 18 years old. I'm not going to be subject to the police department going after, you know, because now the police department's come back. They charge me with trespassing. Everybody in the University of Minnesota community is looking like, what the fuck is this? Right. And we they thought were, he was actually involved in something. Y'all only, y'all, now y'all send him a bull, giving him a bullshit charge. He should have been playing. They still say the laptop story. They so, so, but, still but now, say but the now, but Mall now, of America. They got to find a way to double down on what on the decision that they made or the way they handled it. So what do you think that was gonna be? Let's find Royce doing something else. So now everybody looks at the first thing and goes, ah, well. Congo it, it, it co co corroborates, corroborates a story that around. he's actually a troublemaker. So right. before they get the chance to do that, I, bong, I'm out of there. I'm going to Iowa State. Brad Hoyberg. Went to Iowa State two years, never had one single issue. 
Never had a single issue, was All-American, got drafted, led my team in every stat, was on the honor roll. And I was on the honor roll at the University of Minnesota, academically. Okay? So it plays out the way it's supposed to play out. The point I'm saying the story is the, the, the chief of police for the University of Minnesota, you can go look this story up right now, when they asked me or interviewed me about why I had left campus, and I said, look, I'm afraid. Let me be honest. At 18 years old, when a cop or an investigator sits you down like that and they target you and then they, and then they go out of their way to make sure that the politics don't allow you to play, I don't trust that. That ultimately affected the University of Minnesota, too. Oh, big time. Lost a lot of money. Because, look, you had a future pro that— They lost a lot of money off that. Because Iowa State made money from you going to going— For sure. The Big 12—I mean, you make money when players are really, really good. That's, That's what it is. And not even so much when they're there, but the attraction, the, the, the money that comes afterwards from the conference getting better, right? The, the TV money. All and that. you've seen it in, in going back to, and I'm going to go to the college But the last, the last thing I was going to say was this. You know the Minnesota, the chief of police from the Minneapolis Police Department, when they asked him about me leaving and, and what I had said as to why I was leaving, you know he said that Royce doesn't strike me as the type of individual who's afraid of anything yeah because i said and that's what the chief i said because I, I remember I'm, I'm diagnosed with anxiety disorder right so I, I got anxiety right about a lot of things really at the time it's existential anxiety i didn't realize it i had grown up grown up in a brainwash right. rat, rat 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 maze right and i and i had a spirit and intuition towards something to, to being awake to what was going on couldn't articulate that yet right but it was manifesting in a, right. anxiety Right, panic attacks, right. whatever the case may be. Right, but I was still playing basketball. Right, I'm still, I'm still me from the community. I'm still who I was. So all that comes together, and I say, look, man, I'm, I'm actually scared. Right, I don't know what the police department is going to do. Right, to be honest. Right, y'all already, already trying to blame me for this... something I didn't do. Now you got undercover sitting outside my house at the coffee shop. I've seen this. I've seen this scenario, playing on Donald Trump right now, by the way. But he says to the reporter. You can read it in the paper to this day. He doesn't strike me as somebody who's afraid of anything. I mean, part of him was right. But for a police chief to even say that about an 18-year-old? Right. Right. Come you on. You were already trying to corroborate come on. a storyline I mean, around come on. it. So I jet out. I go to Iowa State. And, and the whole point of me telling the story is this is the liberalism that has come to both represent the black community while at the same time, every chance they get, they want to take down black leaders like me and you. Go ahead. Bingo. And, 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 and yeah, I know we still got time. Yeah, we got time. Um, and, and this goes into all the different facets. But in, And I'm going back to my college experience when I figured it out was when you see the liberal agenda for what it is, especially as a black man, you say, oh, my gosh, my people are in this rat race that – are with, filled with people who say they're for our better interest, whether they're playing the race card or what, but they're actually, they actually hate us. And, and so going to, I went to, so I went to Stout. UW Stout. UW Stout, cr criminal justice degree. I get a job as a, a behavioral specialist at Harrison Public Education Center. So I moved back here. I get my degree. I moved back. Buy a house. North side. Harrison, Northside, worst school in North Minneapolis, right? Federal four setting school. I get there with Kim Adams, Bern Dia Johnson, all of them, and I just take the school over by storm. Now, all the kids from the hood, now I'm 22, 23 years old, and I have people who are in Harrison who are gang members, gang leaders, all of that, and they go there like, hey, man, look, Mason, what's up? How you doing? So now I'm between helping the kids in the community that I know, I'm a little older, I'm 22, 23 years old, mm -hmm. and I have this liberal agenda beast, which is the school district, as the go-between. This is where I say, okay, I want to make a difference. I'm looking at all the black people in Minneapolis Public, so I got a job at Minneapolis Public Schools. All the black people there, they have them working on behavior. Right. So I said, okay. At the liberal schools. At the liberal schools, they got all the black people work right now to this day. EBD. No, not anymore. 
No, they got teachers. They just started getting teachers, but yeah. la- two years ago, I just, was fighting about just it. Just recently. They had 1%, 2% teachers that were But black. not. But where did the teachers come from? The liberal agenda. The, the, liber- the, the, the liberal, yeah. the, 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 the liberal, liberal academia. Yeah. The st- University of Minnesota. But- we got teachers going viral for getting their kids' attention by singing, uh, by skinny, singing skinny red songs. Correct. And I think that's her name. Oh, uh, Sexy Red. Okay. See, I don't listen to this Sexy Red. Now, when I get into Minneapolis public schools, I have my two, this is just kind of the storyline on me, is I get into, I get into Minneapolis public schools. I'm married. I have two children. Okay. I have a house. Now, Jonathan is trying to make a difference. Working with kids of color. Now, I started to see the liberal white agenda, liberal white women Mm -hmm. within the Minneapolis public schools who want to be the white, we call it, they call it in, in the, on the left, white saverism. Mm -hmm. They don't know that they're the ones actually doing it. Right. The white saverism is, I know the plight and fight of black people. I'm going to help them. I'm going to save you. I'm going to save them. Mm -hmm. And so many times. They say they whisper like that. They, uh, you're Save gonna be okay. Us. We're gonna fight against this white supremacist. We're gonna fight Gene. against me. Yeah. We're gonna fight against and that's my, it. me. Right. And, At the same my, time, they want your young black kids yeah. in dresses. Yeah. Young black men in dresses. Dressing them up. No. Charlie's Theron dressing her African adopted yeah. babies up as girls. Why? And, and 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 so as this is playing out, I'm just being more vocal. As a black what are you, what man, what are you saying? What, what are you I'm doing? telling them. I'm saying it at the school. <laughs> I'm telling them we got our own black kids. A white woman's not going to tell you how to live. A kid from the street who got a burglary charge at 12 years old can. Okay. And I'm married. I'm a black man and I know how to maneuver through the system without your ass getting killed. Listen to me. So now I got kids. They they're about to fight. They're bringing guns to school. I'm taking I'm getting I'm stopping all the it goes from 100 percent fights down to zero. Ain't nobody. People say, man, Mason said don't fight. We ain't fight. Now I got now they're saying that I'm a gang leader of the one nine from Minneapolis public schools. I'm getting pulled into the principal's office more than the kids actually in one nine in SUB, YT, Trays, Highs. I'm 23 years old. D nine. Wait, 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 wait. They okay. said what? Okay. So you're stopping fights. I'm stopping fights. I'm taking young black now. Liberal kids. white women are saying that your your success rate. Hold on, let me let me get this right. I want to be clear. Yeah. Liberal white women are saying that your success rate is so good that 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 your ability to turn the school around from a high fight percentage and, and now low is so good. The only possible explanation. Is that I'm a gang member? Is that you're in charge of these? You're running the gangs. I'm running gangs, Mason. You're too. <laughs> this, this is what it is. This is a fact. Raina, everybody. If can you're tell from you. the streets, or you're you're involved with a gang, or you know people who are or from the if streets. If you're helping, this young is actually black, laughable. This is what happened. That to you would. Fred. I mean, come on. I mean, you're from the neighborhood streets, but to, to call you a gang leader is in the laughable. school when I'm right now. Now, did I have my cliques growing up? Yes. Was I running around with gang members? That I knew. Yeah. Now, yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Did I have some friends that were one nine and them D nice? And, yes. Okay. Now they all, we all took different paths in our life. Which At is eight, good. Eight, which is good. Yeah. He's Stop dead. trying to force us to be gang members for our entire lives. Right. We don't want to just because I'm helping my community. They want to force Jonathan Mason to be a gang member. It, then they want to watch you on TV rap about being a gang member so they can masturbate. It's ridiculous. At the same time being in a dress. Now, 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 <laughs> young thug. Okay. okay. <laughs> this is the reality. Now, now, he Little went from. Uzi Vert. Yeah. Okay. He went from slime, what up, cuz, to now he's in jail on a RICO charge. The same people who did a RICO charge against Trump. They better start catching on quick. The same people who did the RICO charge Fanny. against Trump are the same people who were involved in the prosecution that is still currently taking place for rapper Young Thug, who, just by coincidence, is somewhat infamous for having been a rapper who put a dress on yeah. in a commercial. To be successful. Right. Yeah. And so many of us, and so I'm a black man, and so are you, who can correlate the two. How can you correlate Donald Trump with- Young Thug. Young Thug. Same and Only people. black men. Same prosecutors. Same prosecutors. And it's the same beast 
that pr- propped up Young Thug, and it's the same beast that's taking him out. Oh, same one. Oh, 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 whoa. Oh. You really want to talk about the correlation? Here we go. I knew I was going to do it. This is what this is Jonathan you, Mason show you, coming to. If you soon. really want to talk about the correlation, let's just be all the way clear. Yeah. This is the same liberal mainstream media industrial complex that also propped up Donald Trump when it was avid, when it was convenient. Absolutely. When he was the when he was the brash, no nonsense, charming, uh, personable businessman, and it was the Apprentice, and it was ushering in reality. You're TV. fired. When it was ushering in reality TV, they had no problem with Donald Trump. They loved him. He was making special guest appearances everywhere. Oprah loved him. Oprah. Bill Clinton. Everybody loved Oprah, him. Oprah busting it open for him. Let's be honest. And now, they love him. And now, the- soon as soon as it no longer soon as it no longer suits them or benefits them, they're coming for you. This is the Marx. This is the this is the mentality of Marxism. This is what Yuri Benzinov. Benzimov said in his whistleblow on the communist agenda that came out of the KGB in Russia, psychological subversion. He said, all these people who are running these Marxists, who are, who are, who are um, being run right. by the Marxists, yeah. the running dogs, right. all these running dogs from Marxism think they're getting some elite high up aristocratic spot when it's over, when it's done and the job is complete, they're going to line y'all up and shoot you in the back of the head as they do to every one of the people that they prop up and do, okay? Mm -hmm. And so now when you're circling around to Donald Trump, we can talk about who really sold him out. Sean Kemp, or not Sean Kemp, Kemp, Brian Kemp. Brian Kemp. Brian Kemp, it's in Georgia. Governor Kemp, okay? Now, Rhino, Chris Christie, the same one that was running around with you sloppy in the White House, breathing all on you, now he can't wait to turn on you. We have these individuals that are around us that if you don't pinpoint, and see, black men have a very good, if the moment you tell a black man says, I don't care about radical materialism, you're a threat, <laughs> period. Because you're not willing to put a dress on. You're not willing to sacrifice somebody. You're not willing to do this, this, and this. For money? For money? You serious? And we've been holding all the money away from you, and you've been eating bologna all your life, and now you're not willing to go eat this filet mignon and leave those n words alone, Royce. It's We're allowing like they, you. They into- set the system the way it is. Yeah. They 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 teach the narrative, and then when you reject the narrative, they get offended. No, I mean it's they the put all these level. booby traps for black men, right? <laughs> we scoot around every Teslas. single one of them. Teslas. Oh, it's, no, what are you saying? It, the Teslas is it's like a I'm path dri- on its own. I'm, I'm on driving. The path. It, yeah, I'm, I have the GPS located in a sl- selfless drive driverless car, okay, and knows where it's going, perfect speed and everything. I have people standing on the sides of the highways throwing boulders in the lane for no reason, <laughs> like a video game, for, like a video game to distract me and throw it. And, and going back to the booby trapping, they have this for every young man, black man. You scoot around all of them and your Bolger, your big boss that you have to fight is collegiate school. And then you had to go through collegiate school yeah. to now get into an employer that you have to toot your ass up in the air for or you lose your job. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't even have to be that. It could be COVID. It could be your next in line or your, <clears throat> well, we don't have Title IX no more. And now we don't need you to say you're the token Negro. Okay. We're in it, but it's not. It's not. Is it just the black man? Because they do a different trick. No, on no. Black it's women. A, the, okay, <laughs> you knew you guys <laughs> a setup. Hey, you guys, that was a setup question by Royce. They have bamboozled the black woman. Okay, the black woman, and the, and I, and no one has ever talked like this and and use these terms. The anti-black man, black woman, anti-black man, black woman, who the liberal <laughs> agenda parades in front as the savior. The black woman is prompt up because we know in Lind- with Lyndon B. Johnson, when they destroyed the black family, when you take the black man out and you say, oh, I'm an independent black woman. You I ain't finna have you in my house. Um, I, you know I gotta get my welfare. I gotta get my stuff. And, 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 and so fast forward, it's turned into the fannies. Yeah. It's turned into the Kamala Harris's. Yeah. It's turned into the Oprah's, the the 
the black women that you know for sure, I can put in front. They can be DEI everything for me. They can shut up the conservative black man. Now, n we talked about this recently, and, and that was basically my story. So we're about done with my story. We're fast forward. I just got arrested on. No, uh, now for 10 years, ever since then, you rebelled against the liberal white woman. Oh, now you're I've going been, hard in the streets. I've been going hard in the streets. Me and you took the lead. Okay. So, okay. I can talk about it. Wrap it up real quick. Yeah, go. I'm in college. I get in. So I Joe get, Rogan and, and fucking Eddie Bravo, and then went four hours. Yo, me and you could go fuck. This is go. much more riveting. Oh yeah, it is. Then jujitsu jokes. Yeah. No, I love I love Rogan and Bravo. We love Rogan. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, we, Rogan, we got to do me, Jonathan Mason, Rogan, Eddie Bravo, and Joe Rogan. We might be a twenty four hour <laughs> straight. Twenty four hours legendary. legendary. Um, and and Joe Rogan, we really need to have Royce on the show. You two together, when, I, I would love it. When 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 you get around to it, Joe. Yeah, yeah. Whenever he gets well, around, we're here to when it. you get around to it. Yeah. No, you got a lot of people like Bill Maher's cuck ass. You want to bring on? He's a cuck. Yes. He got married to <laughs> Superhead. Which yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is a fact. <laughs> it's a fact. It is a fact. He was married to Superhead. Had her, had his nose wide open. Black woman. Yeah. Anti black man. Black woman was actually sucking cock, in spite of black men. Yeah. And, and testified to it. Yeah. In her book. Yeah. Said that she was... Rebelling, basically. Against the black man. Black man. And that's yeah. why she went to the white man. And we have black women. This is the... That's the same element. I'm glad you said that. Yes. That's the exact same element. What is running the movement right now? When we ran out for George Floyd, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody seen what it was. Everybody, for the most part, in Minnesota knew I was conservative. I went out, I was protesting for Donald Trump. They were calling me racist, right? Mm -hmm. But I was leading all the community stuff, so it was throwing them off. So 21 years old, I go to the Harrison Public Education Center. Uh, basically, they drown me out because I'm a powerful black man that's stopping all the violence, and the, the money's actually getting seized up because they say, we don't, we're having kids who have Asperger's and autism, and they're listening to Jonathan, and all he's telling them, come over here, you done doing that? And they, they come over there and they stop doing it. it. It was very easy for me. So I said, okay, now there's a lot of money that I could be disrupting within the pharmaceutical industries and all this. Because if I say, you guys are running a game on young black men, calling them EBD, you're giving them all emotional these drugs. Emotional behavior disorder. EBD, emotional behavior disorder, mm -hmm. what they have 90%. 90% of the kids are white. They have ASD, 90% they of the They tried to black diagnose kids. me with it when I was in grade school, and, and my mom told them no. She wasn't gonna, They wanted to put me on Medicaid. They wanted to put me on... Um, Ritalin, probably. Ritalin. Yeah, Ritalin. Yeah. My and mom now, told, my and mom now told we know no. about Ritalin. Right. White, liberal white women wanted to put young black men on, on Ritalin. That's all they're doing in they Minneapolis. Y'all don't get it. Y'all seem to think that these white liberal women were ever anti-Big Pharma. They've been pushing Big Pharma drugs on young black men for years. Ritalin. Go he ahead. just hit it. Minneapolis public schools, right? And these are their numbers. They're telling you they're 66% per, uh, not proficient in reading and math. That's their numbers, and you keep on giving them a billion dollars. Fast forward. I'm in Minneapolis public schools. I go to Edison High School, okay? This is where I run into the liberal regime. I have Carla Steinbeck, Aaron Warney, Aaron Rafty. I don't know these people. Before. I know liberal white women. They know I'm in Minneapolis public schools. Oh, now the white women. Three liberal white women. I'm doing all the work. The kids are calling me the principal in the school. The parents don't want to talk to nobody but Mason. Now Mason's got this aura around him. <laughs> Edison, I'm getting paid sixty some thousand dollars a year. I'm at my limit with a degree. Okay, black man barely making it. Working all damn day with the black kids because they don't want me around no other kids because I'm like, we don't have education programs. Why don't we have an auto automobile? Um, why don't we have, if you're worried about black people, why don't we do free oil changes? I can get all, I'm empowering these kids, right? I'm, I'm changing curriculum, all this. Watch Mason, right? They get Mason. Now I'm getting calls in from random people saying Mason's, He's too close with the young boys, telling them, "Hey, look, um, he's too friendly with them." As far as saying, he he is he a gangster? Still, this is this follows me. Is he related to people in gangs? What's going on? It's always following me because I gravitate to young black kids yeah. who I see liberal white women. If you don't come here now, Jonte and five, 
for I'm like you. They love your, They love the gang affiliation if they can reference it to talk yeah. about how white I, cops have have wrongly murdered you. Right. But as soon as your gang affiliation could give you some success in teaching young black kids, they don't want it. So I have a liberal white woman counting down to ten. With the, this is where a couple of the situations where I left. Right. One of them was a lady. She was counting down to this kid who's seventeen years old, like he's a five year old kid. He's looking at me. Ten now, if you don't listen to me, we're not plan ignoral. Ten nine. I come in and say, hold on, hold on. The kid's seeing me. He's hot, angry, and he look. We're not finna count down to him like this. He know what, look, home, you good. The police ready to arrest him. So this liberal white woman telling the police, I count down to 10 and he doesn't listen, go get him, okay? Now I come in, hold on, hold on, hold on, buddy. You're not finna arrest wait, wait, him. Wait, wait, tell us the story again. So the kid. What, what tell her? What's okay, okay. Show me, show me, <laughs> show me. The, What's going the on? Enter workings okay. of the white liberal woman's okay. mind. This is it. Okay. This is from the belly of the beast. The kid, uh, Edison we, we'll tell, High we School. We bring it to you. This is the Jonathan Mason show on Please Call Me Crazy. Yep. AKA right over the top. Yep. And we are here to profess, to testify to the true dynamic of, of the white on. liberal psychology, particularly as it pertains to black people in the belly of the beast. Go. Bingo. She's counting down. The kid says, hey, look, Mason, the teacher keep messing with me. I'm not going to school. I'm not going to the classroom. They're going to kick me out in two minutes. You're going to come get me. Then we're going to walk around. I'm not doing this every day. Now, the lady says, you go into the classroom or this room, or I'm counting down. Mason, I'm not getting no credits. What's going on? She's counting down. The police officer's getting his gloves on. He's ready to arrest them, and they're going to take him out, whatever the case may be. I don't know. Bring him downstairs. He said, I'm not moving. I come in here and say, look, we not finna count down. I'm, well, the kid's right here. We not count down to him. He's 17 years old. So I'm psychologically playing what I'm thinking she's supposed to catch on. We'll, we'll figure it out. We'll get him back to class. We'll get him on his collegiate stuff. Or uh, you get him doing his schoolwork. Now, Mason, I got this. Telling me to shut up. Okay. Now, the kid, I get the kid, defuse the situation. It's done. Now, I get pulled down to the office. He says, you're overstepping. We went to school for this. I am a doctor in this. I know how to work with kids of color. Okay. Now, this is what they're telling us, okay? I'm a professional in it. Now, you done, you're popping all type of pills. Now, now I'm, I'm thinking in my head, I know you. You're popping all type of pills. You got four or five therapists, okay? You have a, your, your hair is purple and red and all type of different colors. You and your husband, you, I don't know what's going on with y'all, okay? And you mean to tell me you got more sense than me right now? This is where black men, and we cut right through the cheese. No, I don't care about your schooling. I don't care about none of this. Jonte finna listen to me. Jonte, come on. We're not finna play with these people. Come on. Man, I'm listening to what Mason talk about. And we leave, okay? They didn't like that. Power grab, okay? Now, the next one was, I got the pit. This is when Jonathan said it was enough. I'm doing my job. There's threats going all over. I go to the bathroom. It's March 2nd, 2016. From March 1st, 2016. On the wall, it says, Donald I'm, Trump's just been elected. Just got elected. Now, let me tell you this. I'm going so hard for Donald Trump. People are telling me to take my, this is when live feed was just had Philando Castillo got killed. So I didn't even know about the damn live feed. I get on the live feed that changed my world. They said, oh, they can't shut Mason up at all. Now I can go live and talk to myself all day. We doing it. I'm going live everywhere. I go live. So I go live. It's three, one, a white, a white kid writes on the wall. All niggers are going to die this next day. So I'm like, hold on, let me get down to the bottom of this. Hold on. <laughs> now, this is where I seen the liberal white women that don't care about black men. I said, as a black man, I'm concerned. I'm trying to figure it out. Now, I have a couple conservative black men with me. They just black, so they're worried about the shooting. What's going on? They tell me we don't have targets on our back. Okay. So I say, that's it. I go down. I go have to go down to the district. I run into this white dude who's the security. Um, who had a security at the time, he says, I don't know how to police black people. No, this is what they're telling me, okay? 
as a and I'm highly educated. I I'm like, okay, this is done. I'm starting my own business. I'm getting out of here. Mason says, forget it. I can work with the kids. I can still build my own connections. I can still help build programming in the city. I can't do it this way in the school because I'm Jimmy tied by these liberal white women. Mm -hmm. Right mm -hmm. now. I didn't even put the correlation even back then when I'm live feeding Donald Trump. I'm going into the, um, so I had to vote at Crystal Police Department. So I'm live feeding in the Crystal Police Department my ballot to show people. They're calling me all type of stuff. I'm, I'm Donald Trump. They're, if you show that on there, they're going to take your ballot and throw it. Now, hindsight looking about, we don't give a damn about no ballots. They just hurry up and did a whole bunch of ballots. Well, <laughs> this is when they were telling my ballot was going to be disqualified because I was showing people that I voted for Donald Trump. This is 2016. Election temper. Yeah. Like, pff, come on, quit it. So I go ahead and do this. Now the school hears about this. Now, I always thought even, so I'm, what's 2016? That's mm -hmm. four or seven years ago. I'm 29. Okay. 28, 27, really, when election season going, I'm going hard. 28, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, 29, I'm there. I'm like, what is going on? I thought this was all separate, not really even paying attention. I knew about the the interdealings of it, but not to this degree. That the schools were super political? That's it. So Mason said, that's it. I'm going to tear it all down. Mm -hmm. So 2016, okay, I'm already in the community before speaking about stuff, shootings and stuff like this, right? This is why a lot of people think I'm BLM, okay? Because I was out there before them, right? As a black man, hearing about situations and circumstances within the community where you're like, okay, this isn't right. George Floyd before George Floyd, right? Okay. Fast forward, fast forward. I start my own furniture business. It goes well. Because you're a carpenter. I'm craftsman by trade. By trade. Okay. The yeah. grandson of a cra all craftsmen, yeah. slavery. Yeah. I know how to do anything with wood, make tables like this, do whatever. So I said, okay, let me start selling tables. And I said, I'm off the map. I don't have to go back to school. No more listening to little five, two liberal white women. I'm six, four, and I can't deal with black kids. You guys have at it. You guys have fun. <laughs> I'm, in, in I'm, the school. I'm on. Done. Mason hit his glass ceiling. He's done. So I said, <laughs> but I'm going to tear up, turn it up. So I go to all the school board meetings. Ed Graff, they spent $250,000 to interview you. Where's the money at? What's going on? I start pinpointing all the problems within the school district and saying, these proficiencies weren't right. This wasn't right. Look what you're doing to the black kids with EBD, the white kids with ASD. You guys are running a gamut. You're running a show over here. Then people in the community said, uh-oh, here comes Mason. What's going on? All the liberal teachers, they loved me, everybody. But they knew I voted for Donald Trump, right? Mm -hmm. So they didn't know. Fast forward. 2019. I'm living life. I'm good. Got a little money in my pocket now because, you know, it had a couple more kids. So now I'm up at now I'm up at three kids. One kid. So I had two. I'm at three. COVID is coming, but I don't know this. 2019 comes. 2020 comes. Now we're locked down. I go on a vacation to Miami. I Everybody's talking about COVID. I go to Vegas right in March, early March. And I knew it hit me. I said, they're shutting it down. This is it. This is what triggered me to become political, right? So COVID. I said, COVID. You were going I, hard I, about I, I COVID. was going hard. I was saying, no mask. Something's going on. Now I'm at the gas station. I'm at holiday gas stations. If turn you guys it up. See, listen, what's funny, <laughs> <laughs> what's funny about this is you got to realize me and, me and Jonathan actually we, uh, knew each other. Knew yeah, each knew other, each but other. really weren't real no, close no, like that. No, no, no. Knew Jefferson, played with him. Jonathan's older than Jefferson. Jefferson's four years older than me. Right. No, no. Jefferson's yeah. two years older than me. Three. Three. That was 34? Five. 35? Yeah, so three. Three years older yeah, than three. me. Yeah, three. So he had been a senior when yeah. I was a freshman type, yeah. of, type of deal. Yeah. Okay. Mom Dukes calls me. Oh, that's what I'm having on the podcast next week. You gotta have your mom. I'm having mom. Mama White is coming into oh, the studio next week. Oh, don't make me have less. Come on. Oh. <laughs> Jonathan Mason Show. That might be my first guest. That might be my first guest. Y'all gonna see where it came from. She looks just like me too. I talked to mom this morning. She was at, she's she's at my house and she's leaving the house. She goes, oh, I need to come on the podcast. I gotta tell him. I gotta I gotta I gotta come on there. I said, Mom, you coming on next week? Yeah. I said I said now nah, I'm gonna ask you. you. You didn't get vaccinated. Why you didn't get vaccinated? 
She said, because I don't know them motherfuckers like that. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, I love it. And that's how we actually, okay, let me, okay, so Go 2020. Ahead. No, it's going to. No, hold on. I meant, I meant to tell it because. I didn't even know Jonathan like that. When I went to go lead the George Floyd protest, Mom Dukes was already putting, she was already watching Jonathan yeah, on live. Already. She was like, I don't know how. I, I didn't know nothing about it. I didn't know nothing about the live. I knew you. I didn't know nothing about the live. Right. She was like, I'm watching this dude named Jonathan Mason. I'm like, I know Jonathan. She, I'm thinking, she's watching you go live. I'm thinking they like little short videos. Come to find out, you're doing a whole hour, hour and a half shows every day. Every morning. Every morning. She's like, I'm watching Jonathan. You need to go get with this dude. And so when we got there, when me and Jonathan got together, oh, it, it was, was over. It was like a match made in heaven. Yeah. So let me, let me, I had to get there. 2020, I leave Vegas. I know something's going up. March comes. But at beginning of April, I had enough with everybody already. They're locking it down. Mason's just getting out of the being, you know, under the regime of the liberalism. I'm making a little money with the furniture thing. I'm traveling however I want to. I'm an empowered black man, right? I'm a business owner. I love it. Learning taxes. It's own hands. Yeah. I'm make, making my money from Home Depot wood and selling it to people in Minnetonka, and they loving it. And they're telling me, can you make five more for me? And that's another thousand, two thousand? Absolutely. Let's do this all day. Nation of shopkeepers. Oh, okay. This is why they hate small businesses. And it's going to wrap. And this yeah. all comes together. So I'm thinking, of, I'm learning taxes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm learning all these various things as a small business owner. And I'm saying, who in the hell would ever want to be a Democrat? If you're taking all our taxes, Minnesota, you're doing all this and you don't, and yes, you can write stuff off, but then if you write some stuff off and it's not right, the IRS is coming in, you're like, Oh my gosh, they just want you to rather go work for $20 an hour and say, take all my cash. And then I get one large lump sum for $3,000 at tax time. And we're good. Okay. This is what they were doing to me. And I didn't know. So now my business is suffering because of COVID. April, I'm upset. People don't even want to meet up for tables no more. So I'm selling tables. They're like, no, COVID, we don't know. They're telling us up. I'm fed up. I said, I'm starting mornings with Mason. Okay. Everybody... Jefferson, everybody too. Every oh, I don't know, Jonathan, you talk a lot of stuff. You're bringing our families into stuff. I'm going up the middle. You guys don't see. This is it. This is it. If they shut down, I'm telling everybody now in Minneapolis, I'm going live. The live, the live feed started in Minneapolis because of the Philando Castillo shooting. So people didn't know about the Facebook live. So when I knew how powerful live was, I said, I'm going on live. I was doing lives, but I didn't go consistent. Then I said, I'm making the Mornings with Mason show. Mornings with Mason. This is where Rebecca and everybody. So I was going downtown. The city was completely empty, right? Mm -hmm. I was going to all the rallies. I was going to all the stuff. Then I said to myself, I said, I know I'm going to take, I'm going to be able to take the narrative right now. Whatever pops off. Now, being a black man in Minnesota, we know every springtime, if you look back for the last 40 years, mm -hmm. a black man gets killed by police in Minneapolis every single spring in May. Okay. So I'm saying, oh, it's going to happen again. Brandon Taylor gets killed. People are writing me from there because I've been talking about this. Ahmaud Arbery down in Atlanta, they messaged me. And I said, now, if it pops off in Minnesota with COVID and all this, they're going to shut it all down. I'm going to be able to weave the line between conservatism and the protesting right here. Now, I keep going live. I go hard. George Floyd dies. Mm -hmm. Jonathan gets two. So let me tell you this story on this one. Mm -hmm. Two o'clock in the morning. I, um, I'm chilling with my family on a Sunday. I get a hundred, 200 messages. My phone's. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Remember now, this is somebody who not only voted for Donald Trump, went live and showed his ballot for Donald Trump. On, in 2016. On, in 2016. Okay, continue. Yeah. Real Donald. So people are calling me. They're calling me racist before they're calling white people racist. I'm the, a black man descendant of slavery that fights for black folks. Don't get it, though. Um, they're calling me everything, okay? So now George Floyd dies. I've been going hard about anti mass I'm walking in places. They're trying to kick me out. I'm standing on it. George Floyd dies. I get all these messages. Everybody says, hey, Mace, it's time to roll. I knew it was time to roll. Your mom was on my live feeds. Mm -hmm. She says, she calls me and says, you got Jim Royce is down here. Steph, uh, Steven Jackson's about to come. You two need to go. 
you were feeling some type of way because you were really realizing about the mass stuff too. What is this? What's this going on? We I already knew because I was you, watching War Room. Yeah, you so were I watching. Knew, I knew yeah. The, I knew the virus was coming three months in advance. I was just waiting for it to to, to hit hit the show. I'm watching. You watching Steve Bannon. I'm watching Bannon and Peter Navarro's, and I'm watching all yeah, these. Yeah, you were watching things. Navarro big time. Navar I love Navarro. I yeah. love Peter. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I'm ben, mastermind. Been telling me about Navarro. Yeah, big time. And then you were like, oh yeah, Navarro. Yeah, Peter Navarro. Navarro. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's like, Banner's oh, boy. Yeah, that's Banner's boy. I'm like, <laughs> see how it all comes together. Yeah. So now I go down. I say, man, look. Everybody's like, man, we going down to down to the thing. Well, there's if you know the dynamic of Minneapolis community, we have various community activists, leaders. You got the Nakimas, you got the Chantel Allens, you got the Black Lives Matter, you got all these various groups, but no real conservative alpha black men, right? Yeah. I knew Roy's from when he was younger, so I seen him. We seen knew each other, knew of each other. This dude, high, you know, number one basketball player. I, well, me and my family, Jefferson, Jermaine, everybody, we're all basketball going huge. So I knew Royce, right? So I'm like, what is this Negro doing in the city? He pulled up, popped up, and he's got a dynamic behind him because, you know, we weren't tagged in on the conservatism side immediately. It was more of like, we got to do something for our city. Big St. Paul, big Minneapolis, coming, we coming together. There's, thousands and thousands of people we gonna figure this out right we link up we go marching pretty good safe good we marched it meet up again march we go to the u.s bank stadium we march we go to the federal reserve we're 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 leading the front right we got took the highway took the no we're going we're marking he said university we go down university mm -hmm. i'm getting thousands of calls everybody saying hey look helicopters in the air we got the crowd still at u.s bank stadium and you guys are right by bobby and steve's <laughs> like we were are in university we were so far down university the line hasn't even left at you know and that was the iconic video or mm -hmm. photo that Beyonce and everybody shared that was, of, March from, that was us. Yeah. Right. Me and Royce look at each other. We're taking the highway. Okay. We're got to. we we go down. We got Jeremy Sutherland. Everybody's with us. We jump down. We jump. Big Reg is with us from the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. You know, Tile, everybody. We get out there. Helicopters everywhere. We we're sitting out there. We know we're gonna stop something. Sit everybody down. All the the state has now been under curfew. So now, due to our protest, it got so massive, they were like, shut the whole entire state down of Minnesota. No, no the curfew was because of COVID. No, no, but Remember? it was but it was because of COVID. There was already it was a... because of super spreader events for us. Right. They were already putting it. We were the first real super spreader no, events. But the, but the lockdown, the curfew had already been in place from COVID. No, the curfew that day. Was in place from COVID. Well, see, we were getting various stories. I was a member. We didn't they know. We didn't know. They it was it, really because of us because they should have probably did it. The, yeah. the, the, the uh, you yelling in the mic. It's I'm gonna, screaming. I'm am. The, 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 uh, yeah, the, uh, they tell it. We all stuff in the studio. They, they telling us, they, they, they told us a bunch of different stuff. But what we knew, the government's telling us that we got a curfew. Yeah. There is no curfew. Black, black folks in the government there telling us. There are no government curfews for American citizens. And we said that. And when we jumped out and said, freedom of speech. Freedom of movement. Freedom of movement. Sovereignty. What is our safeguards for the freedom of speech? We had, we asked, this was, was funny. Let's talk about it. Yeah, let's talk, let's about, talk it. about it. Hey, people can say what they want. A lot of these conservatives are scared to go in the belly of the beast. They are so sure that all these people in these deep blue districts really, really believe in these politics, they don't know, like me and you know, we've been in there. We've yes. been right there with them. Yeah. A lot of these people don't know anything about the super politics going on with this with this country. No. They have no clue. No. They had no clue what the Federal Reserve was. No. They had no clue. They had no clue. Sovereignty. Remember the word when you said sovereignty? And and I was looking at everybody. Me and you, we're talking Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, mm -hmm. um, interest rates, mm -hmm. inflation. <laughs> we're going up mm -hmm. during George Floyd, right? Mm -hmm. So at our meetings, we were talking sovereignty. You guys get paying attention to what the Federal Reserve was. When you said sovereignty to the crowd of people and they looked at you like they didn't have a clue on what was next for our society, I said, me and Roy, and this is when I knew for sure we were like, 
we got to take this a whole nother notch. Like, we got to go a whole nother angle. There, We're not going to get... Because really, really, the George Floyd protest, the whole George Floyd thing became a beta test to diagnose where the awareness, the political awareness was of the people in the Twin Cities. Correct. That's what it became. It wasn't intended and to be that. And we knew that. We knew that. At, I, well, we didn't know it at first. No, at first. But, but once we got out there and started talking, it became very clear, like, oh, people really got dragged out into the streets for this George Floyd thing, which is a terrible thing. But it was the globalist initiation but to it their was plan. Just, it was just, they they had fallen victim to the same thing that we were talking about, black people falling victim to in the bubble of the neighborhood. Yes. Just yeah. a little bit bigger. Right. These liberal people live in these liberal cities with all of these corporate sort of cultural norms and 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 getting your politics with your french fries you know sort of fast food politics through the headlines or the or the mainstream uh uh, uh you know uh, prime time don lemons or cuomos or whatever you know i'm just getting i, I want to be involved in politics i want to i want to be up on something because i went to a liberal school trained by marxists so i'm taught that i need to be involved right with the machine right you know, or else the other white people will look down upon me for right. not being right. humanitarian enough. Right. Right. So I got to give my money to the to the uh, to the the kids in Africa with the flies on their face. Right. Right. Remember those right. infomercials? Right. Or we wow. found out that was a fucking scam. Yeah. Okay. And and so I got to do that. But how do I really? But but and, and then I also have to live up to whatever the the whatever the the story is at the time. I got to live up to narrative. So the way to do that, I got to jack into Cuomo. I got to jack into John John Oliver. I got to jack into John Stewart. I got to jack into to uh, 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 and Rachel diagn- Maddow. And, and, and listen to your politics from that angle. I got to hear it from them on the go as I'm grabbing my 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 mocha latte and my crumpet on my way to my my job that's turning me into a surf. So when you get out there and a Royce White stands up on the bridge with a bullhorn in front of twenty thousand and says. The establishment has taken your sovereignty. Everybody goes, "What the fuck is he talking about?" Right. What is what What is this? Did not not only do and I we not, ran into it so much. Not only do I not know what sovereignty means, it just doesn't sound like what I'm used to on MSNBC. Right. It, it just the the spirit of it isn't the same. So there's a natural rejection from that. But then, the the genuineness of real leaders kicks in too. So you can't have you can't help but have that endearment. That's why we ran into so many liberal white women that were fawning over us, being in the leadership position. But then we and, and again, for all you for all you white people out there in middle America, patriots all across the country understand that the psychological, the psychological subversion of the Marxist uh, uh, ideology, we know it very well very at the well. highest and most predatory level because these these liberal white women were fawning over me and Jonathan. Correct. Love, I mean, romantically, sexually. Yep. Love a black, because we fit all of the bill. When did they start hating us? When did they start Articulate, hating us? educated, uh, clean, well-dressed, right? Well-spoken. Well-spoken, charming, right? You know, th- th- talented. Right. All of these things. Took leadership roles when it was time to care, take care about what's going on. Yeah. So at the same I can't tell you how many, I can't tell you how many women message me with the hard eyes and the and the oh. thank you so much for what you're doing. Strong black man. You're, you're you're this is incredible. You're fighting for your people. You're fighting for all of us. It, you're you're it's and it's and, and PS, it's really hot too. Yeah. It turns me on. It really, yeah. Makes it, me wet. Honestly. <laughs> uh, no, seriously. That's what they're saying. Let's, let's be, the, keep it real. That's it. This is Please Call Me Crazy right over the top, the Jonathan Mason show. <laughs> sure, you get we're it telling wrong the truth. Here. This is what they were saying. And so, and, and but it didn't take long. Yes, they they like people to step up as long as it fit the narrative. Right. As soon as we strayed from the narrative. And what was that? The LGBTQ. No, and... It, we, no, it we was really me, yeah, LGBT. You know, that, that was okay. So did we had. But a it was. Of it was. It was. It was Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. Mm. It was the mask COVID mandates. Man- mandates because mask in mandates. our meetings they would say in the meetings we're planning protests and they're saying, "Well, we got." And if you see pictures of me and Jonathan, you'll see 
He had mask on. Sometimes we had masks on. Sometimes I had a mask on. I had a nice custom. My my habit. Yeah, the port days. <laughs> yeah, I had the yeah, I had the Dos Equi style mask but on. But there was, was many times it was you more didn't of a, wear it was it more of a fashion. Oh yeah, that was. I, first of all, well, let's. I'll tell the story. First off, person who knows me the best, my mama and my tailor. Right. My tailor knows me the best, and I spend a lot, a lot of time with my tailor. <laughs> right. they, they ain't really seen me with the suits yet because I'm in, I'm in MMA fight mode. Right. But as the campaign kicks off, they're going to see that I'm, I'm very, very... Suited and booted. ...into being well-dressed. I, I, actually, I actually wish I had been living in a time, even though the race relations weren't great. I, I, I love looking back at pictures and seeing times when black men wore suits. I love it. All around the, all around the country. And all people wore suits. Right, I think right. the whole society wears suits. Now right. everybody's, you know, a little Finocchio with their with their three quarter t shirt and their and their fucking skin tight jeans or whatever. It's, you know, homosexual to me, but hey, you know, to, to each his own. Um, but anyway, my tailor knows me very well. So the mask thing's popping off, and they're making these custom masks with fabric with like argyle, and they're making them paisley, and so they're they're doubling as a mask, but a pocket square. Right. Now I'm so I'm so impressed with the fact that this mask. Is, right. is fly like that and it doubles as a pocket square. I could take it off and put it in my pocket. Right. It's like a little pocket. Right. I'll like, give me 10 of them. Right. Just happen to have a black one. Right. You know, with the skull, with like this, with the this gradient skulls in it. Right. And it was right. just fire. Just No, I still loved got it. it. But anyway, so I was wearing, so I'm wearing the mask when we go out. But, but really what they were saying to me was like, you know, as one of the leaders, really what they were saying to me was this. Legally, this is, and this is, <laughs> This is how the Marxist liberal establishment always tries to get you. Yep. You know, I mean, a black man was murdered, and we're all trying to fight against white supremacy. But, I mean, <laughs> legally, I mean, we're still responsible for what happens, right? And they're like, you know, um, you know, if, if, if Tim Waltz says that there's a mask mandate in effect, or no, not a mask mandate, but there's a there's a COVID lockdown in, in effect, and we're choosing not to listen to it. The least we could do to be be masked up so we're not being super spreaders like the Trump events. What was I saying to him in the meetings? Fuck the masks. Right. Don't come in here right. at talking to me about no motherfucking masks. A black man couldn't breathe on the ground, and you're talking Stop about a mask? Stop talking to me about <laughs> liability. Period. I don't want to hear about liabilities. I don't want to hear about... Remember now, we're really orchestra or organizing these things. We two black men oh, and now, other and black no. men are organizing fifty to a hundred person group discussions about these 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 demonstrations regularly coming out of our own pockets, coming out of our own pocket to do it. And guess what? For the most part, they listened. Oh yeah, I'm gonna be honest. Yeah, and even we turned a few of them. Yeah. Oh, we I'm, oh hey, look. We found out some of them aren't weren't as liberal as they, they thought. Thought they were. Yeah. They we actually find that when you get deep in it, you find out who's actually riding. Some of them actually don't even know what's going on. What the political, what the political divides are. No. They they're getting it on the fly. They're getting it fast food. So when you really start to get friction in a room, you see people start to take sides like, wait a minute, what'd you just say? That doesn't sound right. right. Or that doesn't sound right. Or that ain't right. right. So we had that whole dynamic. And my, my whole point in telling the story with the masks is the masks were the indicator that the liberals who want to stifle the conversation and keep people from really standing up in a real way, right. they want people to stand up in a sort of theatrical way, right. but stand up in a real way, their linchpin is always the legal. Right. It's always the liability. It's always the insurance. It falls back to the globalist it's the, it's I, all, it's, identity. It's always the governor said this, and if you go against this and someone gets hurt, and this is this is where Super the rubber spreader event. This is where the rubber met the road for me. When we're on the bridge, we take the bridge because it's a federal highway. Right. I mean, duh. Right. The federal government is out of control. Tyrannical. The federal government is a leviathan. Whether it's Barack Obama, who ran as an anti-war establishment Democrat, but then bombs more brown Middle East people than all of his white predecessors combined since I was born in the 90s, right. Desert Storm, George Bush, and on. Um, whether it's him and, 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 and that, or, or whether it's, you know, um, uh, pick, pick one. Pick right. a, it doesn't matter, you know, right. whatever it is. The liberal establishment, they want us to fall in line, right? They want us to, to, 
to toe the to line. To the system. They're telling us, they're telling mm. me, oh, the federal government's not too big. No, it's not the federal government. It's just the police. White supremacy. It's white supremacy. It's not the federal government. It's not us. It's not social programs. It's white men. We need to expand social programs. It's white men. And and and, and for us, I'm like, yo, I have what we brought. Oh, and this is another thing we brought. I have so many white friends who are conservative. Look, I wasn't going for it from the beginning. We had AJ's coming in. I kept, yeah. I kept saying from the oh, AJ was sniffing them out from the beginning. AJ was like, I'm uncomfortable here. These people are these people are horrifying. And he he didn't really pop around too much after no. because he was like he he knew he diagnosed it right away. No, no, these people, all the he, he say funny stuff after the meetings, like when people get into you know we're talking about planning and we go around and get somebody's opinion because we want to let everybody you know kind of have input. It's a community, and now so all of a sudden somebody just goes into one of these self reflective, oh. poetic sort of diatribes, <laughs> crying, crying and shit, and and AJ's just like these. This is the crisis of white white America. We need Starbucks and cocaine. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm just, we're tired of it. As you're still in black memorabilia as artifacts. So so this this what rubber met the road for me. We go out onto the bridge. We slow the bridge down. The, the semi truck comes onto the bridge, and everybody was saying afterward, "Oh, you put us in danger. danger. We were in actual danger." These guys are radical. They put our lives in danger. There were no security protocols. These people actually view protest as a theater. And this is when I realized that the black nonprofit activist community around the people in the metropolitan area of any given city are stage play directors. That's it. Theatrics. That's what their that's what their that's role it. is. That their is role, their role for the system. Their role is to coordinate the theater, work. the theater of protest that they call work, with the go federal government officials, with their guidelines to create the false catharsis of anti-establishment energy. And then it really hit me. That's when we really knew. Then it really hit me when January six popped off, because yes. I was certain I was like, all right, let me see how they going. Let me see how they go. Well, remember this. I'm knowing the deal. Prior though, this 2020. Right, prior. To remember we talked about Joe Biden. The moment we said, oh no, I'm not doing Joe Biden. I'm doing Trump. Yeah. Everybody hated me for sure. They said Jonathan is a Trumper who's totally talking about red meat politics. And he's talking about white supremacist Donald Trump stuff. And I said, now, a black man that's willing to die, I didn't want, oh, we even went to the bridge. We staged the biggest protest in Minnesota history. I'm talking about, we did 20, like 25 protests, bro, like legendary. 100,000 people. 100, at least. Over 100,000 people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To being called a racist and become, or be called, or called, uh, what was it? Uh, what else would they call us? They called, Darling of the alt right, the, the, and that was more of a few. Uh, but uh, they were calling yeah. us. Um, <laughs> it was something. They said alt right loves me. I love the alt right. Yeah, yeah they love but me. And when I we love them. when we seen the po political, <laughs> I don't know what the alt right is. I guess it's me. And they want to take all of our movements to voting. Remember when they would say, Mason, you guys, we've got to use our voice at the ballot. And I'm saying, hold on, we we all voting for Trump, right? And they said Trump. He's the one who caused all of this. I said, Trump killed George Floyd? What it, what it, what it, what, who, 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 who? <laughs> don't do it. Because I'll say a name. <laughs> I'll say a real name. No, no, no we, we can't doing do a name. We can't we do names because they'll kick us we're up. Not, we're not doing no, that. No, I ain't going to throw nobody under the bus. We're not doing I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to say, I'm going to say with, with, with 100% without doing that. Because I yeah, ain't doing, we, I'm not doing that. No, we ain't got to do that. But I'm going to say this. A lot of people put a lot of time and energy into shifting the conversation or the energy around the protests we were doing that had to do with the federal government and the Federal Reserve right. and the big corporations. Right. A lot of people put a lot of energy into shifting that focus to voting. Right. Vote this, vote that, vote this, vote that. Get people, uh, uh, what's the name? Remember, and remember, the one attorney 
white woman gets sloppy drunk every weekend. Right. I ain't going to say her name. Right. She right. knows who she is. Yeah. Liberal white woman came, offered her legal services. You know, I'm an attorney. I can help you guys if you guys need paperwork done or whatever it is. And she was also in charge of the voter registration. Right. These are the liberal white women who got educated by the Marxists who are in the system, but put their weekend cap on and tiptoe around like they're anti-establishment so that they can trick communities into voting. These right. are the Democrats. These are how the Republicans don't even realize they're being cheated yet. Right. And they, they don't lose it off it. The, the, the deaths. Death of black men. Heterosexual black Death men. Death of black men is the number one way to broker black votes for the white liberal establishment. And y'all are still out here saying, let, let's let Liz Collins, let's let Liz Collins be the keynote speaker in CD3. The oh, wife, yeah. the wife of Bob, Bob Crow, Crow, who was the head of the police union when George Floyd was killed. Right who were saying the whole George Floyd thing was a hoax. Right. I mean, it's, it's a like, hoax. No, the, the, he died man, of COVID. The, now the, you guys are saying he died of COVID? You you don't like COVID, but George died of COVID. COVID's not real, but George died. But George died of okay. it. And and now, and... The, and These are the, look, the brown coats are coming. Look, I said it the other day, and I'll say it again today. Everybody gets to decide where, the, the way the country burns now. Everybody gets to decide the way the country goes down now. If you want to play some little bullshit... Race game, the brown coats are still coming to get you. Coming. And guess what? The brown coat, the number, the two people that they're coming to get specifically, Christians and yeah. and the nation of shopkeepers. Yeah. Do you know? I, I believe that the IRS has implemented a new law that people with bank loans had to pay the difference. 70 on like let's say you had you paid 30 percent right on your interest for the bank loan they're charging the other 70 percent as a taxable income Mm. so anybody anybody who has a small business or even a middle market business Mm -hmm. anybody who's not a global business a globalist business big box anybody who's not getting a dei index uh, right. Uh, score. Yeah. That level. If you have a loan with the bank to operate, they're going to charge you interest on 70% of that loan. Mm. I know also that, that all, it's going to ruin the middle market. It's going to put everybody out of business. They're doing They're going to start going bankrupt left and right. They're already going bankrupt. They're, go to why go to go to go to uh right over there by Boulevard. Dix is gone. Yep. The three businesses that were in the little building. Oh, it's cl- cl- collapsing. This is where we're at. We seen it in 2020 where we said, okay, if they're implementing this, right, and and they're doing all the telltale signs, we already were saying that it was going to be rigged. We, we we said this way before. Now, we fast forward to 2023 where, you know, you're running for Senate. We had, the, your, we had your, we and we ran into it at the election last year. Or the last time yep. when we were trying to get in, we had people on the Republican side were just as bad as the liberals on the left side. Because what happens is you have a group of rhinos, you have these establishment Democrats, and they want to continue this system that they say yes. is working. Yes. Going. Yeah. But, and let's let's just be I want to be even more clear about this because it's hit me right now in real time. You know why? You know why the think of let's just think about it culturally. Mm-hmm. Let's think about it. Let's think about it culturally. Right. Who would have the least problem with a with a nationwide welfare state with central bank digital currency, social credit scores, and essentially um, universal basic income? Who would have the least problem with that? Democrats. No, no, no. Be no. specific. White liberal. Well, Women. Women. Yeah, absolutely. Who want to have posh book club, book, posh book club uh, uh, um, uh, community gatherings yep. where they talk about gossip and, and, and you know, <laughs> and, 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 and get, get real strange with, with all of this cokehead veganism. It, it was what's right. going on. Cokehead, vegan, shaman, numerology, astrology, whatever. And they, they're bringing a the black they, woman in, too. And they want the black woman. And see, this is it. We but I'm saying, about, when you really think about it, they would love 
a universal basic income welfare state. That's coming. They would love to have a, a, a micro apartment, a micro apartment, a woman all by herself, where she and she only lets the man in whenever her sexual desires oh, reach no that kids, level. No kids, only dogs. Only do, uh, one, no, one no, dog. No, you can't have a dog anymore. What? Oh, you, no, no, no more dogs. Where Your dogs going? are a drain on the climate. Your dogs need food. You're going back to gigapets. <laughs> no, you <laughs> got, you got, about meta, you got metaverse. You can have a pet in the in the VR in the VR world. You can have a that you'd have to take care of. A virtual pet doesn't need meat. A virtual pet can give you the same sort of dopamine, uh, 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 you know, satisfaction. It's so inhumane for the pets to be at the house all day while you're not there, especially in an eight by eight micro house. You don't have a big enough space to to house a dog. It's it's not right. You know. Meanwhile, they'll go and clip out all the dogs. Where are the dogs gonna go? When, when, when you think about it. All the dogs that are alive, when the white liberal women give up all their dogs in the name of the climate, what do you think they're going to do with those dogs? Euthanize them at the shelter. That's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to euthanize, and they do it right now. The white liberal woman is the bane of, the, uh, of society. I'm just going to, I'm, and her cuck boyfriend. I mean, th those two together. See, and, and that's it right there. You have this metrosexual, mm -hmm. liberal white man. No, he's at the top. You, you, you guys, sure. no, he's at the top. Okay. Biggest that's the Joe Don Biden. Don Magic Wand. No, 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 Joe Biden. No, no. He, he, he's the white Don Jacob Magic Fry. Wand. Okay. Big pimping. Spending all the cheese. Bigger <laughs> pimp than Maurice. Way bigger. Bigger pimp than Unk. And, and, Remember and, I told and, you the only Way fans, bigger than them. And the, the people laugh at this when I say this. <laughs> the Ukrainian man who owns OnlyFans gets paid $1.3 million a day. A day. That's three hundred and thirty-eight million a year only on working days. He only gets paid on working days, no weekends. He makes three hundred and thirty-eight million dollars a year. He's pimping your daughters, your mothers, because mm -hmm. the kids are saying, "My mom's on OnlyFans and they bullying me with her pictures and stuff." Mm -hmm. That is the new pimping regime for America. So it's these same girls, and we ran into them. I don't want to be sexualized. Well, you're on OnlyFans selling pussy pics in picture and um, foot pictures. Oh, you know, you remember I got first selling what? Foot pictures. No, no. The number one thing. You know what's paying the girls? Huh. Number one, it's not pussy or titty pictures. What is it? It's feet pictures. You guys are promoting predators. The pred. Who do you think's buying foot pictures? Predators. Pedophiles. Pedophiles. Really predators. Sexual predators. Predators, right. You guys are breeding and facilitating nothing but predators, and you have the nerve to tell me that you don't want to be sexualized? You know I was you know I was suspended from Instagram this week. Oh, and I see that. And, so, and then they said sorry. They said sorry. It was a mistake. But I, I put on Twitter, I said, it's so odd to me that on Instagram, because I called somebody a pussy, and I got suspended right after that because it asked me a question like, do you want to edit the comment? This He gives you a prompt now. This comment is one that often gets reported by others. Dude, would you like to edit it? And I, no. Right. I, no, I put the same thing again. And then it suspended me. And <laughs> <laughs> Right. And then, so it was right around that time, and I had called somebody a pussy. And it was really somebody who was probably a Republican because they follow me and they, you know, they all right. come. But they were like, you're fear-mongering. Because I, I put the, I said, look, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't like the language of the podcast, I think we did a good job of not cussing today, but I don't, I don't know. If you don't like the language of the podcast, go sit in your house and wait for them to come knock on your fucking door. Right. You're fear mongering to act like the government's going to actually come in our so homes. So the Instagram said fear mongering. No, the person I was talking oh, to. Right, 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 right. And so I called him a pussy. Right. So then he probably reported you. Okay. So now they, they, they disable my, because they disable my account. By mistake, they said. We did it by mistake. And I said, though, I go, it's so interesting to me that you can show your pussy on Instagram. You can sell your pussy on Instagram, but you can't call somebody a pussy in on the it. comments. Wow. I think that, I think that sums up the, 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 liberal, the liberal ethos right there in a nutshell. It's very hypocritical, but see, it's not even hypocritical. It's like, uh, it's it's like uh, diametrically opposed. It's like it, it, it's 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 one plus one equals four. It it, it has no, it, it's oxymoron. It, it has no gravity in any re, in any reality. I can't say the word pussy in the in the comments. I can't call someone a pussy. 
but you can shake your pussy and, and this, sell it. And you this, can it, say, you can actually prostitute. Everybody knows. No, wait, let's let's be clear about it. Everybody, you got people who are advocates, women advocates, abuse, abu- women who are abused, right. advocates, who advocates advocate against sex trafficking and and human trafficking and and pimping and and prostitution and, and, and all of this stuff. Everybody knows that the girls with the hyperlinks to OnlyFans on Instagram are selling pussy. Period. Everybody knows that's it. it. They're, se- they're they're prostitutes. And Instagram just lets You're it getting happen. monetary money. No, why doesn't Instagram look when I try and go to the she the, the pronoun uh you know you can put your pronouns in. Yeah. I try to go in there and say, fuck you. My pronouns are fuck you. They won't let you. They won't let you. So they have the capability to make sure to, to they have the capability. They're promoting pimping. They're promoting it. They could easily make it so any OnlyFans accounts or accounts that go to uh, uh, sexual uh, sexual transaction sites don't work on the site. They love it. They right. love, they they've 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 integrated the platform so that it's easier for OnlyFans yeah, models to make here. money. Place the link here. Here's the highlights. Here, the whole thing is around us. Or a, a, when you look at your story, and the top three, four people mm-hmm. are all fake ass profiles with asses hanging out. Look, I'm 18 plus. I have it. I can literally pull it up oh, right now. Oh, recently turned eighteen. On your thing, you see, in, in in black in men in general, men all together, not mm-hmm. just black, mm-hmm. all men. Mm-hmm. Okay, right now, stop going on all porno sites. I'm telling you guys this now. They're going to start putting viruses on people's laptops and phones. And they're going to say that you have child this pornography, por- 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 porno on there, and it will be on your phone. I'm telling you guys this now, before it all starts happening, people are saying there's operations that are coming, and they're going to be targeting people. You oh, click, they're going to be targeting Christians and nationalists. And they had it, and so, remember this too: the government. But then they let Jeffrey Tubin on the on the primetime news jack off jerk jerk off of the year and and CNN Jeffrey has Tubin. and CNN has Jeffrey Tubin still on and think we forgot oh, yeah, that on. he was jacked off in front of everybody Je- and you're mad at Donald Trump saying grab him by the pussy which he was just actually saying that Jeffrey Tubin whacked off on a Zoom call <laughs> and is back on TV back on TV jacked off in front of women this is women now first off if your name is Jeffrey Tubin. If your last name is Tubin. Serious. Be nice. Be nice. No, I'm just being serious. If your last name is Tubin. There's not only so many of them. So it's No, I'm being honest. Let's just be, right, be for real. Say it. <laughs> you being you being funny. You playing. Oh. I'm being serious. Okay. If your last name is Tubin, you should not. You should always, always jerk off away from camera. The tube. <laughs> away, if your name's Tubin, you don't want no nothing away on YouTube. Away from any cylinder, new tube, visual tube. devices, television, whether they're cameras on 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 your laptop, whether they're camcorders. And, and see how easy it was. Jerk for off him? away from guess anything what that's a tube shaped video device. How do you go right off the air? I'm talking about within seconds. How are you go- talking about? Well, he this? did it on purpose. That's the obvious answer. Oh, okay. Come on. I, he didn't know he was off air. No, he's been doing it for years, he said. <laughs> I didn't know the camera was on this time. Okay. I usually jack off when right off the business is business. So, but <laughs> I know I know time's getting low. We got about five minutes. I think we're almost at three hours. This is the longest podcast we've done. We're right at, we're, we're, we're wrapping Three up. hours? Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, we're five minutes from three hours. This is great. Unbelievable. This is right great. Right over the top. Right over the top. Jeffrey Tubin, stop jerking off in front of, the, he did it on purpose though. I'm just going to say. In my opinion, um, it's it's obvious that they're nor- what they what they're doing is they're normalizing sexual perversion for their selected political aristocratic right, elites. Right. And so they're saying, "Oh, Jeffrey Tubin jerked off in front of all these women. He didn't realize because the digital the digital component was in between him and the the victims of that of that act." Right. And then they'll say, "Well, but but such and such," and they're, they're going to start. I wouldn't be surprised. If there's an entire crop of America First candidates in this coming election cycle that have uh, child um, that have child porn 
digital evidence brought against them that that is cooked up, right? Because you know that that's what yeah, the, that's what it, it, it's going to be. They're that. normalizing on their end, correct? And that's going to make it even it, 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 crazy. It shouldn't, but it will make it even easier to demonize the the nationalists and the Christians on our end. Yeah, because they'll say you're Christian. They haven't see what happens is they make their narrative so nasty and perverted that you can't right? you can't you can't them. when you yeah. criticize them it's like yeah but we sleep with dogs you know what I mean it's not like yeah. I'm a holy person I have children yep. I my kids are good I'm a small business owner and you're jacking off everybody's jacking off it's just how you're demonized at that time no it's just that the other Republicans and Christians and nationalists won't come to your defense out of fear of them being associated with you for sexual perversion. That's it. That's what they're really doing. Right. They're isolating you from your own your own brigade. They're isolating you from your own support system. And and, and which and, is so CIA. And, you to know, do. Yeah, I mean, well, that's Matt Brosky. Look at Matt Brosky. Yeah. He's going to say something. He puts my picture up to say this is represent Royce and me are not representative of each other. If I do something off the how wall. Ra- how racist is that? That's racist. But that would Come be on. like me saying, well you took pictures with Anthony Tony Lazaro. And all of the Republicans did that knew he was gay and having porno channels, and you guys didn't care about it. He had a it. gay porno channel. Yeah, gay porno channel. And they all took money from him. And you all got money from him. Yeah. But Mason, And I don't really know. You know, I don't know Tony Lazaro. I don't know how no, much. No, and I don't know. And guess what? We I don't can't, know how much. I don't know how much of the 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 um the allegations around yeah. underage. What, what, uh, um, it was like 14, 15. No, what are they? What is, what's the uh, statutory? Trafficking. No, statutory rape. No, trafficking. Human trafficking. Okay. His but it was statutory, lines. though. Right. But it was also statutory. Right. Because they were young. Right. Okay, so I don't know how much of that is true or how much of that is boogied up. I can't tell. Right. But and I do knowing know. And if you're in a state, a liberal state of Minnesota, yeah. and you're a conservative, yeah. and they know it, they're going to pin you. He got more time but before than that a person even, that killed somebody. More time than murderers. How do you get more time no, than murderers? No, human trafficking always gets more. Pimps are getting 75 years. But not only fan CEOs. But not only fan CEOs. Yeah, they're good to go. Unbelievable. But my my point with Lazaro was, even before the the takedown with the statutory human trafficking stuff, the fact that he had a channel, porno channel, with gay porn on it, should have probably been a no go for a lot of these Minnesota Republicans. We weren't in the Republican Party at the time. No. So no. And then when, when, when and this then all went down, we won. When we abortion, won really when we talked about abortion, and the I'm, I'm, we're at our first Republican huge meeting with all these starch Republicans, and we're saying, "Yeah, we, what are we going to do about this abortion? Do we mm-hmm, talk about it?" Mm-hmm. And they say, "You don't talk about abortion. I believe in it." Oh, so maybe we're too conservative at, as black men in the state of Minnesota because all of you guys are rhinos. We immediately said nothing to, uh, we don't want nothing to do with Mitch McConnell's and the Lindsey Grahams's yeah. and the pa- Paul Ryan's and the Chris Christie's because we could see right through you. As a black man, we know Donald Trump. Be very careful of Chris Christie. He can't slow down with Eden. He ain't go- <laughs> Trust me, gluttony is one of the one, number one deadly sins. If he's doing that to kill himself, watch out. It's no different than a person saying, I'm ready to kill myself. Yeah, slow down. It's two different things. So we have to still, and I'm not judging nobody. What I'm saying I is, am. what well, a lot the, of these people are just way too You got to watch them. You got to watch people's actions. I'm just being honest. If you're a lot sloppy. Of you have, a lot of you have been systematically, systematically made to be overweight, respectfully, to everybody out there. Yeah. And you know, Jason talks about it a lot. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm overweight. I'm working on it. But you hop on, a, on Jason's live. He's on the Stairmaster at night on the live. He's trying. A lot of these people are just Chris Christie. You know, and let, let me let me just be clear. And about gluttony's this. about overeating too. It's they not- want to make you fat. They want to make you dependent on the government. They want you to buy a micro house. They want you to be high. They want you. They want every part of your life to to take away your freedom. You know, and I'm not talking like freedom on paper. I'm talking about the freedom that they make that you lives so in the human spirit. Yeah. Okay, and you talked about demoralized. this. Yeah, demoralization, but uncomfortable. When you wake up every single day, you're disgusted with yourself. You have a small place. You're cramped. The simple things in life, and this is what I believe us as conservatives understand this, is, and not radical materialists, to say, you don't need much. All the things in life that are really good for you are priceless. Mm. You, you, we have the American freedoms. You want a house. 
with a land, okay, that is sustainable off the off the grid where you're saying, I'm not getting GMO foods. I want seeded foods. I don't need to have these freaking cricket burgers, right? I will have pasture raised beef that I know is going to help be healthy for me. But so many people don't want to take that transitionary jump from the system to actually doing what America to needs to, to freedom. Mm -hmm. And that's where everybody is. And, and, it's, and it's not just the Democrats. No, it's not. God, God, God help us. It's a lot of Republicans too that, that talk about the system, that complain about the system, but they love the system. They love it. They love it all. The rhinos are great about it all. Elon Musk, he is great. He on Twitter is <laughs> a business. He has to worry about the advertisers. And then I he tell him. He can't be a free speech absolutist. He has to worry about his advertisers. I mean, it's a business. It's America. This thin veil of of cap this this thin veil of 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 free enterprise and free market. Oh, you hit it. This this thin veil of of uh, of capitalism. This thin veil of of um, of business that has been allowed to be the uh, the compass of the American identity is the real issue. Right. And as soon as the Republicans stand up and say enough and kick all these corporatists out of the party, you know, from the Koch brothers all the way down to the Karl Roves, then we could actually start to get some shit done. And because we're winning the conservatives, and I know we got we're going to end on a couple of these points, but the conservative argument right now going into this 2024 election, mm -hmm. we're winning. Yeah. We're winning on everything. If it's guys that can't get pregnant, we're winning. Um, if it's, um, you know, Joe Biden going to sleep, d d uh, Hunter Biden, crack cocaine, uh, we're winning. Oh, Biden, uh, Obama lying and being, Ob being, oh. being, being married in public, sucking dick in private. Uh, I said, and, and I, we, uh, not only, air. not only, and hey, I mean, we're not saying that, look, I don't believe in a homosexual lifestyle, no. but but you're a you're a citizen. Yeah. You have rights. But when but, you, but about, as black men, what though, about him cheating on a black woman with a white man? Is that not white black supremacy? Black men <laughs> and white black women have said Barack Obama is such a black man. He's so strong. He has yeah. a black wife. Yeah, come on, he, this is a black. Come he's on. having sex with older seventy year old white men. The man went to Harvard. Okay. Enough said. Thank you, Royce, for having me and being Appreciate able to have you being my, back my... Home, man. Jonathan Mason, everybody. The show's coming soon. Right over the top's coming soon. Yep. The Jonathan Mason show coming soon. This has been another incredible family and friends guest episode of Please Call Me Crazy. We appreciate your viewership and listenership today. And in the future, the fight continues. Don't die a jerk off like Jeffrey Tubin is destined to. Yeah. Um, Godspeed. Godspeed. Thank you, brother.